What is up, wrestling fans? Welcome to the second of six pay-per-view point editions of the Smartout Moment Smack Talk podcast coming your way this week. We're going to get into our predictions here in our full preview of WWE's WrestleMania 37 extravaganza. The granddaddy of them all is coming up this weekend. We got two nights, a lot of matches to break down, and we're going to give you our thoughts on all that stuff. I am your host, as always, Tony Mango, and I've got with me, as always, Robert E. Felice. Hey, we're back in business, y'all. And WrestleMania is not just back in business. It's also too big for two nights. And just like that, this podcast is too big for two hosts. We also have Callum Wiggins. We don't have uh, any stories or real excitement surrounding this, but fans, we got fans. Enough. <laughs> fans are back. That's all, right. that's all that matters. That's all we that's, need. Uh, at the beginning of this, we kind of assume that that's going to be how WWE approached things. And look at that. We were right. Where <laughs> It's all that really matters. So we will talk about our predictions. We will talk about the full card breakdown for night one and night two. We're just taking it all in one shot instead of doing this in two separate podcasts because you don't need to listen to that uh, twice. And we want you to do the same thing and tell us your thoughts on the pay-per-view and what you expect to be happening, what you're hoping is going to happen, and so on and so forth. So drop a comment below on YouTube in particular. And while you're over there, hit that subscribe button if you haven't done that already and ring that little notification bell because that way you'll be aware and you'll get those email alerts when we decide to go live on all of our post shows that are coming up. Remember, we're going to do post shows for both nights of NXT TakeOver, and we're going to do post shows for both nights of WrestleMania as well. So that way you'll know exactly when we go live and you won't miss a thing, unless, of course, you're listening to it afterward. And, you know, if you can't join us live, then that's a shame. But if you can, join us for this, uh, the chat and, you know, chat us up, as uh, Conrad would say. But the game plan seems to be pretty locked for WrestleMania right now. They might change some things here and there. And of course, if that happens, we might get into some of that stuff with the hot tags and kind of update some stuff a little bit later on this week. But we're not only going to give our predictions for night one and night two of WrestleMania, we're also going to give our predictions for SmackDown because they're treating SmackDown as if it's like the pre-show or something. And we've already talked about how we hate that idea. We've already talked about how it's ridiculous that these people aren't on the card and that it's not going to be the same if like the tag team titles change hands and it's in front of nobody. And no matter what you can argue, it's not the same to be in front of the Thunderdome in a pre-taped thing than to be in front of a live crowd at Raymond James Stadium. It's just not. Because so if it was, then you could do the whole show mm -hmm. from there and you don't need to go through all this trouble. I will ask... Uh, when we get to it about a potential match that's likely going to change because they already put a graphic up that's already changed and whatever, we'll come back to the SmackDown side of things and ask, I'll ask another question about that. But let's get SmackDown out of the way before we get into WrestleMania itself. And um, just the same as with the WrestleMania stuff, I want to know what your thoughts are. So again, drop those comments below. And while you're over there, hit that like button, hit the share button, hit the applause button if you feel so inclined, hit the join button. And that's the same thing as to Patreon. So go to patreon.com slash smart out moment and show us some support and keep the wheels turning here by tossing a little spare change our way, because that's not only a motivational thing to make sure that we keep doing this going forward, but also it's a means for me to put some money back into investing into the channel and the website and to make sure that we're just giving you guys more and more content, more support that we have on both, both, both. Shh. I don't know why I had that kind of thing there, uh, both an emotional and motivational side of things, but also on the monetary side of things, the more that we can bring you guys. So keep that in mind. Dollar a month bargain. So those SmackDown matches are the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal match and the SmackDown Tag Team Championship Fatal 4-Way. The four teams are the Dirty Dogs, Champions, Alpha Academy, the Mysterios, Dominic and Ray, and the Street Profits. And the people that are involved in the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal, unless they change it, which they could always change it because they don't really care. So. They're not really going to name all these people, are you? Oh, it's not a whole lot of people. I'm going to name them pretty quickly. All right. Just to give you an idea of how they're 
approaching this and how it never really matters and it never really means anything and that they clearly are not going to be booking this and anything in mind of like, well, that's our spot for this guy kind of a thing. It's Akira Tozawa, Angel Garza, Cedric Alexander, Drew Gulak, Elias, Eric, Grand Metalik, Umberto Carrillo, Jackson Riker, Jay Uso, somebody to pay attention to, Kalisto, King Corbin, Lindsay Dorado, Mace of formerly Retribution, Murphy, Mustafa Ali, Ricochet, Shelton Benjamin, Shinsuke Nakamura, Slapjack, T-Bar, and Tucker. No Jeff Hardy. That's the first yeah, thing I want to bring up. <laughs> That's weird. Um, I'd like Jeff to go to AEW. I do think he just signed a contract. Mm -hmm. So I think he's in for the long haul with WWE, probably would and should. And his career with WWE, if you've signed like a three to five year deal, you might as well just start assuming that you'll end your career there. This run for the Hardys has been bleh. And that's already gone. But Jeff... He is such a big deal. And like to me, he's always going to be one of those guys who, at the drop of a hat, could be your biggest baby face because he just has that magnetic personality. But Jeff not being here, I almost hope it was a personal call. And he said, look, if you're not going to put me in front of people, then I don't want to be in the Andre. You know, like, I'll sit home. Yeah, it could just be that. You yeah. think anything about that, Callum? You think it's a kind of a to spite Jeff, or do you think that he just kind of decided he didn't want to be a part of it, or did they forget about him? Or I think he's I don't know whether it's his perspective or just the general perspective. He's too big to be in that battle royal, and uh, but they couldn't find anything else for him to do at WrestleMania. So I think it's one of those weird situations where if they were to put him in that battle royal, it would seem like a demotion for Jeff. And so they decided, what's well, actually better off? We just keep you out of WrestleMania entirely than have you be in that battle royal. Hold on to that, because I'm going to bring that up when we talk about the tag titles, because there's yeah. somebody in there that I'd argue is far too big to be in front of nobody. I get more of the feeling that since it switched over to SmackDown, that's where it doesn't seem right. Because if this would have been the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal at WrestleMania, I think somebody like a Jeff would have been one of the people that you put in there to try to make it seem like it's a bigger deal. But we also have some other people that are like, look, I'm not going to make the argument that like Eric of the Viking uh, Raiders is going to be somebody that you need to make sure that you book for WrestleMania. He's just not in that kind of a spot. Great talent, but you know, I mean, there's levels of priority. There's a totem pole here, but some people, it does feel kind of like, you couldn't figure out anything better for them to do. Like, I don't know. I mean, Sheldon Benjamin and Cedric Alexander, this whole breakup of the, the Hurt business is a story in and of itself and something that I think that they're going to kick themselves for. But out of all the things that happened, just a few weeks ago, those two are the Raw Tag Team Champions. And they dropped the tag team titles and immediately it transitions over to this different feud. Like literally right after they drop the titles, it just becomes, oh, it's Styles and Amos. And then they get excommunicated from the Hurt Business. And now they're not only not even in the Battle Royal at WrestleMania, but it's more than likely that they're not even going to be potentially the winners of the SmackDown version of that. That's terrible. I feel so bad for those. I feel so bad for all of these people because, yeah... You know, somebody like a Kalisto hasn't been around for months, and I don't assume that he was expecting he'd get some big prominent spot at WrestleMania. But goddamn, I mean, the Hurt Business, and Ricochet, and King Corbin, and Shinsuke Nakamura, and as problematic as they are, Retribution didn't get a blow-off? You mean to tell me that they couldn't have had some kind of a three-minute segment at WrestleMania even? You know, Retribution still yet to perform in front of people, which is the most fucked up thing because that will forever be this angle that existed solely because of and during the pandemic. Very weird. Somebody like a Murphy too, like 
I don't know. Not that this is a big prominent spot either, but I would have thought that maybe Murphy would have been accompanying Seth Rollins ringside and Shinsuke Nakamura oh, yeah, would be backing up Cesaro. Again, didn't they? Didn't they? They just dropped that again. Murphy is... They put him back with Rollins for like a week or two because they needed somebody for Cesaro to beat. And they were like, yeah, Murphy. He's not with Seth Rollins. We broke them up, remember? If I'm Murphy, I'm looking at my contract and I'm going, man, I gotta leave. Yeah. So out of this group... Oh, go ahead. I would say, I feel bad for all these people that might be looking at their contracts now and saying that they have to leave because I think AEW's doors are about to be slammed shut. Why is that? They have too many people. They have too many people for free shows they have right now. Well, they still have that other show that's coming, though. Exactly. Well, yeah, but... <laughs> yeah, but what, what else can you really do with all of that stuff as well? It's not like that's going to be a separate brand or anything. They're going to... At the end of the day, the ones that are going to be most prominent will be featured on, should be featured on Dynamite every single week. So it's not like, let's say, for instance, that Murphy gets released from a contract. It's like, yeah, he's a really, he's a really, really good wrestler. There's AEW's always it. It's really, AEW's going to really prioritize getting him in. Yeah, but for where AEW might shut their door, Impact might treat him like the oh, second yeah. coming. No, ab- no, absolutely. I'm saying, saying with that regard, as I'm saying, like he should be looking at his contract, but then he shouldn't be expecting you shouldn't be expecting him to pop up on Dynamite anytime soon. It will be his path, or and the path of a lot of these people now will be Ring of Honor, uh, NWA, Impact, those sort of places. AEW, you, I think, especially for these people at the bottom, like for Ricochet, of course, they would allow for that sort of talent they wouldn't let that talent go to waste or anything on those lines but nakamura certain... you know like nakamura yeah. the higher yeah for certain of these people they have reputations behind them that precede them prior to joining wwe that would help them the other people would have to essentially do something somewhere else to prove themselves worthy of going to AEW because otherwise you start getting into the mindset that AEW has been looking to avoid of it being labeled the next impact wrestling it's just like okay the next ex wwe guy comes onto the market and we're just going to snap him up immediately to be fair, though, for AEW, they didn't snatch up, like, Zack Ryder, for instance. No, no they so. put him in for a little while, and, um, yeah, they just, like... <laughs> and promptly said, oh, you want to go somewhere else? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so I, that's what I like about the fact that AEW is dirty, but the fact is that AEW has too many people. And I look at a lot of these people, and I think these guys would all be, not all of them, but most of them would be so much better off somewhere else. But I'm just wondering where that somewhere else is. I mean, some of those... I feel like a Murphy. I can see him being like the guy in NWA where they just go like, okay, well, you're the guy for the next five, 10 years kind of a thing. And it's somebody. Cool it. Yeah, for real. Uh, I mean, he can't be around forever too. That's another thing. That's, that's what you think. He's probably, he's probably the same age as Murphy. Really? I thought he was older. Uh, well, everyone in WWE is old. I thought uh, Murphy was like, Maybe 32. like my yeah, age. Like 30, 30, 34. And it's in all this like 45 or something? No. No, he's not 45. He was no, maybe he just looks 20s, a little older. Than... You know? He's 34. He's there two years apart. Ah, oh, okay. Well, he just, I guess the suits that he's wearing recently are just making it's me that think that he's older. For a... It's because Aldis has been around for a really long time, but he signed with TNA when he was like really early 20s. Hmm. Ah, no, never mind he then. Already... And he was pushed immediately <laughs> because. Uh, when someone signs with uh, other promotions, they don't have to wait until their 30th birthday before they get relatively pushed. <laughs> pushed. <laughs> uh, you know, somebody like a Carrillo, of course, uh, like you take him to another market, he might be a bigger deal. He's not going to be a big deal in this. Somebody like Tozawa, he's fantastic in a lot of different ways, but they never treat him like he's a big deal. He's a comedic jobber, so... Most of the people what, that are on this list are on that lower end of the spectrum, even if they have the talent to be higher. But that's interesting because the, the one glaring omission that I see in this match that really should be part of this match and could actually add a different element to this match altogether is our truth. He's also missing from the card. That's right. And I got a little bit of a theory about that. That the reason why he's not in this Andre the Giant battle, uh, I'm not going to say the whole thing, <laughs> in the Andre, is because they have something else for him to do just as like a buffer skit at WrestleMania. 
And I think that he's dropping that title to Logan Paul. Uh, there's a good chance that would happen. I mean, look at what they did last year. They built this whole thing about Gronkowski somewhat around the 24-7 championship. That's the thing that I, they can get the most eyes around, you know? I don't know how they would be able to do this, but, I mean, if they could if they could use plants in the audience, just people that they've, like, obviously like acquired and stuff like that, you could... <laughs> no, not Mitch. <laughs> but they could do something where you just have all truth get pinned by someone in the crowd in the crowd because fans are and back then, and, and then throughout the rest of the show it's people in the crowd pinning each other to win the the 24 7 championship until our truth wins it back at the second night the last guy to get a pin for on someone social just, distancing just, just, <laughs> just to celebrate like oh, okay this yeah i know but just to celebrate the fact that there are fans <laughs> in the crowd just like okay the fans are just gonna all win the 24 7 championship at some point I'm just I expecting Logan Paul. <laughs> concept, but I like well, it a lot. I tell you, you, use plants to do that. So like yeah, use... but that doesn't stop the real people from being like, oh, fuck, I want to get it on that pile. <laughs> yeah. You just get that um, security guard that prevented uh, Gronkowski getting into the thing at one point. Just to oh, she'll fuck it. him up, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no uh, Riddick Moss in this either, or oh. Wesley Blake. Now, they're people that haven't been doing much and it's not like people are going to be like, no, oh my God, Wesley Blake's not on the card. I'm not going to watch like that kind of thing. He's just not a big prominent guy right now, but he's one half of the lone, the Knights of the Lone Wolf. Yeah. He's the only half of that, but that's something that's a little bit telling too, because they didn't even bother to put him in here for that. So he's clearly just like push him off to the side and forget he exists in WWE right now. Because he's not yeah. even in, like, NXT or anything. It's just put him back in NXT, you know? In the case of Moss, I know he's still hurt. But oh, he actually is? Blake, yeah, he's still nursing that injury. But in the case of Blake, like, God, do you just feel like shit about yourself? And then, like, it sucks for him. I'm not, like, trying to make fun of him or anything. I just really want to know, like, what does a talent feel at that point? Yeah, if you're not good enough to go on the SmackDown, throw everybody in there that doesn't have anything else to do. Jobber match. Disappointing, I'm sure. Still throw him out there just to give him a payday, like. Yeah, uh, I mean, he's got a what third kid on the way, I think. Yeah. So out of this group of people, I can see a couple people winning, unless they have some other kind of like surprise, like you know, oh, actually, you know, Great Carly came back and he is doing this, and it's a tie into the Hall of Fame or whatever, but I hate the fact that this stuff's happening on SmackDown. And it just makes it matter even less. So ultimately, yeah, it does not matter who wins this because WWE for the eighth time is going to be like, yeah, it doesn't matter. Screw everybody who pays any attention to this. So they could literally go with anybody and it's not going to be a surprise to me because of how little they care. But if they actually do care in the slightest bit, then I'm thinking that it's Shinsuke Nakamura. That's the safe bet. And I'm I'm going to go with another safe bet and say King Baron Corbin becomes the first ever <laughs> two-time Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal winner. And I'll go with Corbin. And I'll go with the safe bet and pick Jey Uso. That's uh, another one that they could just go with just to make it be like, see, you know, he doesn't just always lose and disappoint yeah, Roman. <laughs> Yeah, because his whole thing since that match at Hell in a Cell is he's just Roman's whipping boy. He does need to get, gain some element of credibility. And even though this match, as we said, doesn't mean anything and won't mean anything for the winner going forward, at least it's actually just a match he can win. I think if nothing else, it, it's a match he can win that has no consequence. Genuinely, I believe that Jey Uso should because he was in the main event like in October. It wasn't that long ago when Jey Uso was in the main event of pay-per-views. So yes, he should at least win DeAndre. I would pop if he wins it. And he and Roman are just like, they should, why isn't this the Yokozuna Memorial? Or just like something related to the family. I think that would be good. But I feel like we've chosen the, the three safe bets and really the only people worth a damn in this match. So that means 100% Elias is winning this or something, right, you know? Like, Elias could win this, yeah. Retribution will reform and Slapjack. Win. Yeah. Well, I, I could see one member of um, Retribution winning by just 
I don't know, T-Bar just wins and then sheds his look and becomes Dominic Dijakovic again. I would love to see that happen because I'm a huge fan of Dijakovic. The only issue I would have with that, and I know it's trivial at this point, is he's not a SmackDown guy, but he had this big moment on SmackDown. All right, what are we doing here? Yeah, yeah I don't think that they care in this latest care. bit. I know they don't no. care. But like... It's Yeah, I mean, it's not an excuse. That's the thing. Like, we can say... They don't care. This doesn't matter or whatever. Like, I had tweeted out about this whole thing about I don't think that these two matches should be on SmackDown because it's not WrestleMania. And some people were like, oh, you're delusional. This doesn't matter. So why wouldn't they put it on WrestleMania? And I'm like, well, WrestleMania has uh, an hour kickoff both nights. And you mean to tell me that they can't just cram a half hour of that? Like, and just have that other extra half an hour be the actual card and then take care of it that way. And, you know, I mean, like, they can put this on the match uh, lineup for WrestleMania. And it's not fair to the people. It's not the same. Excuses like, well, the Battle Royal doesn't matter because it never matters. The problem is that it doesn't matter. WWE we should always make something matter. And I don't think that it takes a whole lot of effort to make it matter. It's just don't do shit like this. Don't make it to where you've got Cesaro and Corbin and Naomi for the WrestleMania Women's Battle Royal and whatever. And they win. And two weeks later, you go, yeah, screw them. Like, if you book something to not matter, it doesn't matter. If you book something to be a big deal then it's a bigger deal in the eyes of the fans. It's just the way that it is. And they've been doing this for decades, so they understand that. Callum, I'm actually curious as to your take on that, because I feel like more and more people are just embracing these horrible philosophies of like, well, it doesn't matter. And you can argue that, yeah, it's to protect ourselves from getting our hopes up or whatever. But it's that is such a piss poor mentality, is it not? Oh, yeah. So, I don't know what you expect me to be like. I was going to say something like profound or interesting. Well, no, I, it's a really, I, I it it's a, it's a really like... stupid philosophy to take. But as, uh, as Tony says, if you are just going to condition your fans into believe that nothing matters, you, well, it's, it's, it's twofold is the problem, is that it means that, well, f first of all, it gives people a reason to not care about your product. But then it also means that people complain when other people start to want to care about the product mm -hmm. and they start and they start putting forward ideas of you could do this and then that would happen so like it's just wrestling it doesn't matter yeah and that's that... and that's and, and those people can all suck a huge dick for all i care it's just like, <laughs> it's just because it's like i know it's i know it's just wrestling but people get interested in like well get uh, invested in marvel movies or dc stuff or Get it, obviously we talk about fanboy stuff and stuff like that, but getting invested in sports and yeah. getting invested in it's just the Super Bowl. It, it's, it's just it, a it stupid all... game where they toss a ball back and a ball back and forth. You know, like yeah, yeah. In, yeah, in essence, none of that stuff matters at all. We're all on a giant planet that will be hurtling into the sun at some point in the next millennia or two. So realistically, none of this shit matters in the grand scheme of things. We'll probably all be uh, heat death to like hit with a heat death thing if we by global warming within the next uh three decades or something like that so enjoy it while it lasts but at least you could just like <laughs> not not to go super far down although we are going to get negative throughout this podcast anyway so i might as well hit the <laughs> hit the lowest <laughs> point already but i feel that people you should care about people shouldn't be uh denigrated for caring about this stuff and then, or at least trying to care about it, and complaining about the fact that WWE don't seem to care about it. Now, see, you did what I wanted you to do. You gave the right answer. Like, but it's that's... just, it's just stupid. It's, it's bothering me more because I'm starting to see more pushback in the way of like, oh, well, it really doesn't matter. What are you going on about it for? Because it should. And that's that's just my point. Is that it should. Cesaro won the first Andre in 2014, and it felt like a big deal. And because they didn't capitalize on it, and they eventually gave it to Mojo Rawley and did fuck all with him after, it doesn't matter. And now it's like, it's the tradition that doesn't matter, but hey, look, it's an Andre trophy. 
And it, like I said, it doesn't take a whole lot of effort to make it matter because all it takes is one year for them to have the winner do something for more than, you know, a week. And then suddenly the next year people are going, yeah, but remember last year, this person won the title afterward or something, you know, they don't even have to win the world title. It's just like, let's just say like T-Bar, for instance, you have T-Bar win. He takes his mask off and he says, retribution is no longer a thing. I'm not T-Bar. This mask is dumb. I'm Dominic Dijakovic. If you've watched NXT, you've seen, I can kick some ass. That's what I'm going to do. And then in a couple weeks, you give him one of the mid card belts. Give him a decent run. People are going to go, shit, remember how Dijakovic did that last year? Okay, who's going to win this year for the next one? It's not hard. Well, I'll even say that with something that they have done the exact opposite with. For the last several years, the Raw after Mania has sucked. Yeah. But, well, last year, I can kind of give him a little bit of a pass. But it doesn't even matter because they have preconditioned you to go... <laughs> It's the Raw after Mania, and literally anything can fucking happen. So tune in. Right. That's how you do it. Just like that. Now, this whole idea of conditioning yourself into it doesn't matter or it's good enough is very, very dangerous and just wrong and, you know, whatever. Uh, I think it applies to a lot of what's going on for this WrestleMania card because I'm seeing lots of the two extremes. And this sad kind of realization of, well, you got fans, and that's all that matters, and it's WrestleMania, it's got the name slapped on it, who cares if the story works, or if they spent six months dealing more with a sommelier and and nothing else, or who cares if Rhea Ripley just popped up out of nowhere and she's getting the title shot and she's not built up the way that she should be because you spent an entire year crapping on her. This idea of like, yeah, but you know what? They're going to have people clapping. So I'm, I'm okay with that. It's just, it's not how you should be looking at things. It's not how WWE should be looking at how, how they should put their product out there. We'll get into that a little bit for some of the other it's ones. A, it's a very dangerous precedent. Cause because then setting... nothing matters. Yeah, because you're setting it up like, okay, we can literally do anything. Yeah, and if nothing matters to the point where the TV shows are supposed to set up the pay-per-views, but the TV shows are more important, so the pay-per-views suck, but then the TV shows don't really do anything because, well, they're TV, and TV doesn't matter. It's the pay-per-view that matters. And then if WrestleMania isn't even something that they can put the right amount of effort into really building around and whatever then why bother watching Money in the Bank? And why bother watching SummerSlam? And when you get around to Payback or Backlash, then who cares? And then that's when you get the crowd that goes, oh, well, then none of it matters, so I'm not going to watch. And then you stop being a fan. And that's not what we're looking to do here. We're, you know, we talk about this stuff with the, we criticize and stuff because we know that it can be better. And we know that if you keep going in this down, uh, down this direction, you're going to get to a point where it's you know, WrestleMania 11 again. You know? And for anybody who thinks we're just going to be negative, there will be things on the spot oh, yeah. where I'm at least super stoked. There's some, look, on paper, if I didn't watch any of the product for the past seven months, on paper, this would look like it's pretty decent. But again, I've said this a couple times recently, it shouldn't be a benefit and better if you don't watch, then if you do, it should be the more that you watch, the more rewarded you are instead of the more that you're like, oh, for God's sake, it's the seventh match between Big E and Apollo Crews. You know, I will talk about some positives and stuff. And I was hoping originally that one of the big positives that I could talk about would be Dominic gets to perform in front of a big crowd and he wins the tag team championship with his dad. But there goes that. Yeah, this this one I can't. If you wanted to do the Andre and go, hey, it's on SmackDown, tune into SmackDown, I get it. But this is wrong. You know what it realistically should have been? Even though we can we can talk over and over about the idea that none of this should have happened on SmackDown, but realistically, it should have been the Andre 
and it should have been the tag team turmoil match. Yeah, for the women. Mm hmm. The women. That way, it could have been you got a representation of the women on that side of things. That's kind of the equivalent of throwing everybody into the match. You set up a match for WrestleMania. So that way you go, oh my God, okay, well, that's going to happen. And I get why they didn't do that because they think that it's a cool catch to be like, what something on night one factors into night two, but you could have done that with anything, really. Well, no, that, well, no that's not the reason why they did it. Well, that maybe it's part of the reason, but the main reason is the fact that that means you get two women's matches on both nights. Yeah, that's another thing too, which it's like a quota thing, which you could have done yeah. a better job of doing that too. You know, you could have had like a proper feud with someone or, you know. Well, let's let's just say for a second that, okay, it's a quota thing and you can't move the women's matches. Do the Street Profits winning their belts back and then defending against the Mysterios because they both deserve to be in front of people. Period. They both deserve to wrestle at WrestleMania in front of a crowd. I, at this point, hope that the tag titles stay the same because I don't want Dominic and Ray to win the titles in front of a bunch of screens. I don't think that's fair to them. I would agree, except they're not going to be in front of fans anytime soon. So just do it. Just put it on Dominic and Ray. I think that that's going to happen. I just don't like it. <laughs> that's my pick, though. Dominic and Ray win. And they go, oh my god, look at this. Oh, it's a crazy moment on the WrestleMania it's a, uh, SmackDown. Like, you know. What about you, Callum? You going uh, any direction on the SmackDown tag titles? I, mean, I don't want Dominic and Ray to win. Not because I don't think it'd be a cool moment. It's just they've been booked like shit. They lose every match they have. Yeah, and but again, remember, that doesn't matter. Yeah, I know, yeah, no, that's, <laughs> I know that's, that's, that's the reason why it's compelling me to actually just pick them. Like, I think they're the safe bet, so I probably would go with them. If it was up to me, I'd go with Alpha Academy. They're the ones that have been booked the strongest so far. So then, the next seen... hope is to have a moment after having a pretty good first half of 2020 and then just having a miserable back end. I'd like Otis to have a moment, but realistically i don't think that any of these teams will even be a thing outside of uh, well half these teams won't be a thing in a few months yeah sadly i mean that's how they treat the uh the tag team divisions for the most part so then let's get into night 1 and uh we're going to give like a general idea of like some of the placement of the card. We don't know exactly how they're going to do it, but I will say I am fully on board with the train that Bobby Lashley versus Drew McIntyre is going to open up this night. You guys agree? It's that I believe I'm the one that put that in your head and it absolutely yep. should. Like once you called Drew attention Mac to it to me, I'm like, Oh, you know what? You're right. Yeah. Drew McIntyre has been saying for a year now, I want to be the first person out the curtain when fans return. This gives him the optimal moment to do that while also going with their stupid thing of opening with the main event while also allowing the women to headline. You're killing a lot of birds with one stone. <clears throat> Watch them open up with anything else but this match. <laughs> Watch them be like, so that's exactly why Braun Strowman and Shane McMahon in a steel cage match would be like, oh man. Or like, we're going to give people a chance to pop. Bad Bunny's coming out. <laughs> Well, actually, this brings this brings a good time to ask: Do you think Vince shows up in any way on camera? No, I think he should almost. No, I don't think he does. No, it's not about him. Yeah, no, I think he's. I think he. I think he recognizes that. Yeah, I think he'll be too nice. like too into being backstage and actually watching the thing if he does. Uh, because, yeah, you know, I mean, some people like uh, Triple H might be kind of taking charge of some things. I don't know. But I think it's Drew McIntyre popping out so that way he gets pop. And you start off with a baby face. And for that matter, you start off with a title change. Because Drew McIntyre is winning that belt and he's either getting booed or it's going to be a fledgling cheer in comparison to if they would have done this correctly. But 
you know, now WWE approaches some of these things. It was like, how about we just rush the Bobby Lashley thing for like, you know, a couple of weeks before WrestleMania and make one of the coolest people on the roster somebody who everybody was like, oh, he's finally winning the title. And then they could be pissed that he dropped it so quick. And it's like I wrote a whole article about it. You can check it out. It's the. Uh, no, they're w- setting up Drew McIntyre for failure. That's the, that's the name of the title uh, for the article. It was the. Uh, WWE setting up Bobby Lashley and Drew McIntyre for failure at WrestleMania because it's it's not going to work as well, you know. But I guess they're banking on the idea that breaking up the Hurt business will make it so Bobby Lashley's like, oh, you jerk, he broke up the stable that we liked, even though people are going to blame WWE, not Bobby Lashley, because Bobby Lashley and MVP didn't want to break up the Hurt business, but. Uh, and they're hoping probably a title change to open up the night means people will pop no matter what. So it's not a bad strategy. It's just a matter of like, I don't know if I'll use the same phrase a whole lot throughout here, but this is something that uh, I think does bear repeating. The success of this match is not built on what they put a foundation for the success of this match is going to be based off of Lashley and McIntyre and the circumstances of the fans going, I don't care. I'm in attendance. Yay. It's WrestleMania. And that's not something that we should pat themselves in the back for. Yeah. Then that is true, especially in this match. Maybe it doesn't, maybe there's enough fans in attendance that are still stoked to see Drew McIntyre win. Because I've seen some backlash, but we don't know who's actually going to fill the stands at WrestleMania. And for that matter, too, Drew McIntyre deserves to get a pop. It's not his fault that WWE is doing this in a way that, like, it's just not the Brock Lesnar thing. You can't replicate that. Drew McIntyre is a two-time world champion already, and that was a great setup. Unfortunately, things didn't work out that way, but the Bobby Lashley way of doing things, I don't think was the smartest move because he was somebody that people would be like, okay, cool. Now give him the title reign and you don't set yourself up for somebody else that somebody can cheer. If you want to make sure somebody gets cheered, like that's just, I mean, they should have learned that lesson a long time ago, but I do think he's ultimately going to be cheered more than booed. It's just not going to be anywhere near as big of a cheer as if McIntyre would have been up against somebody who you definitely boo, you know? Yeah. I'm going McIntyre. I think that... uh, That's the only way you could go here. Yeah. I think it would be incredibly dumb to steal um, a line from Shane McMahon towards Braun Strowman. To um to have Drew McIntyre win the championship here. That doesn't mean they won't do it. I mean, yeah. <laughs> they are, because they are incredibly dumb. But it means that they have something with Lashley. And Drew's time is, has been and gone. I feel I feel bad for the guy because he never got to be W WWE champion in front of a crowd. And if they're just gonna lead with sentiment, then naturally they would give the title to Drew McIntyre. If they actually want to tell good stories and make money, then they should give the title to Bobby Lash, keep the title on Bobby Lashley, because this whole thing should be leading to Bobby Lashley versus Brock Lesnar at SummerSlam. That is the money match that they can do now. Yeah, that's the thing that people want to see is Bobby Lashley versus Brock Lesnar, and it means more with the championship involved. And I'm gonna say this, and I know it'll upset Tony, but I miss Brock Lesnar right now. Like, I don't say, I don't say I naturally miss him because he's never really there anyway. So so I don't miss him. It, it mean it will mean more to me when he comes back than the fact that he's been away for a while. But I just don't feel that Drew winning is a smart play to go with right now. It just feels like Bobby Lashley was well, is a transitional champion following a transitional champion in the Miz. And I feel Lashley I don't know, Lashley deserves more than that. Of course he does, but I also feel like how big the Hurt Business got over and how big he's gone over as this dominant imperious champion is actually helping, will actually help him 
well help his uh, claim to keep hold of the championship, especially due to the fact that I know I don't know how much this will play into it, but Raw's numbers have held pretty strong throughout WrestleMania, especially among a younger demographic, and at least some people will point to the fact that Lashley's holding the title being part of the reason for it. And whether it was due to the pandemic or any other, it was largely due to pandemic, but any other factors, the ratings were plummeting while Drew McIntyre was champion. So certain people, I think, will at least be getting in Vince's ear telling him, you can't take the title off Bobby Lashley. But I think that they can't start it off with a heel winning. I think this is this needs to be... They can if, well, I think they can if the fans cheer for him. Yeah, so this is one of the things I think I heard um, Sean Ross Sapp say in one of the recent podcasts as well, just to bring your boss into it, because I do agree with him. I feel like most matches should have two finishes. And they play it by yeah. ear? And they play and they play it by the crowd reaction. That's so the smart hear, way to do things. Yeah, so when they, they if they hear that the crowd are more into Lashley than Drew McIntyre, the referee basically goes up to both of them when they're starting off the match, tells them what who's going over in this one, and then they do that match. Yeah, that would be the smart thing. That would be sure. That's too smart. Like, yeah, I, yeah, I don't think they will do it. See, so it. My head is telling me that it McIntyre will win just because, like you say, they'll probably start off the night with these guys, and they'll keep the title. They want to change the title to add a bit of intrigue to it. And Drew McIntyre is the de facto baby face for this match. But then, but. Well, that's weird because like my head is telling that because I'm thinking with WWE logic and when my my actual logic. I'm actually thinking that Bobby Lashley is the right choice to go with. So it's a weird thing. It's like it's not like my head and my heart. It's my WWE head and my actual head. <laughs> so, so I'm going to stick with my WWE head in this occasion and go with Drew McIntyre because I think it's a safe one. But I might change my mind by the time we do like official predictions for like the fantasy league and stuff like that. It's really up in the air with for me at this one. Like uh, we've talked about before, WWE seems even more so than ever hinging upon this idea of we book moments rather than stories, even though it used to be we book stories rather than matches <laughs> that it became, we book matches and say, so, you know, I mean, it's, it's over the years. It just gets like, okay, you, you book less and less and less. Now, uh, you know, we're heading towards the direction where it's not even going to be, we book moments. It's that we book content and it's just there. <laughs> It's not actually anything. It's just we fill hours, you know, kind of. I'm, I'm gonna gonna pop you with this because I was listening to a Paul Heyman interview earlier, where he called WWE. He said WWE is a content creation conglomerate, and I went, Oh, oh no! <laughs> I was yeah. like, Oh no! That's like, Oh shit! That's it. Everybody, uh, everybody in any kind of this business, ask like YouTubers that aren't like, you know, just somebody pops up in front of their webcam and goes, Hey, I'm going to show you a tutorial of makeup or, you know, I'm going to do like a movie review or whatever. But anybody who's got like a, a group of people that they work together, you know, screen junkies or whoever you might uh, follow, ask anybody in that spectrum, anybody on like the TV thing, anybody in streaming, say the word content creation and they're all going to roll their eyes and be like, oh, God, I'm sick of hearing about this. Because that's like the marketing buzz thing that's around where it's just like you got to just it's quantity over quality. And it's just we need more crap. <laughs> you know. And eventually that bubble's going to burst, too, when everybody realizes that you can't just sustain 15 different streaming services and you all have to combine and it's cable again and whatever. But for right now, that's the era that we're in. We're in the content creation era where. It matters more that there are two mat uh, two nights of WrestleMania than that both nights of WrestleMania feels like WrestleMania, and then in their mind they'll justify it as yeah, but your McIntyre won the title to open it up, isn't that cool? And then it'll be like yeah, but you guys didn't do as good of a job. You could learn from this experience, and then they'll go nah. But what we learned from this experience was if you're happy with that, then it doesn't matter. So I really want to stick to this point of remember everybody. Going into this, write down your feelings about the matches and the stories. Like, we're not going to talk about it right now. We'll wait a couple more matches, but Sasha Banks and Bianca Belair, we can all agree, has been a shit story, an absolutely terrible story. Those two can have an amazing match, 
Do not say it's a great feud. Say it's a great match. So that way, when there's feedback, you're not saying this was great. You did a great job. Just say those two had a great match. It sucks that they were set up so poorly. That's how you have constructive criticism, and that's how you actually get that point across. So that's why it's going to seem like some of these things are negatives, even when there are positives mixed in with there. And I don't want anybody dropping any comments below saying, oh, you hate everything. No, I hate the bad things. I love the good things. That's how it works. If you focus only on one side, you're not going to see the other side, you know. So I am a, f a huge fan of the Hurt Business, and I'm disappointed they broke up. I'm super happy that Bobby Lashley won the championship, and it sucks he's going to lose it so quick. But I'm super happy that Drew McIntyre can get a big pop at WrestleMania. I'm disappointed it's not going to be as big as it could have been. I think that this is the best match to open up the night. It's also a shame that it's the main event starting off. That's how things work. It's 50-50 kind of a split. So there are positives. There are negatives. I'm hoping I walk out of both nights of WrestleMania more on the positive side of things. But we're only one match deep. So let's get into this <laughs> some more. Cesaro versus Seth Rollins, a match that could be on the weaker side when it comes to the build for it because it's just kind of two guys fighting for the most part. But these guys are going to have a hell of a match. And if they do the right thing, Cesaro wins here, and it's the biggest win that he's pretty much ever had. And probably ever going to. I, let's call a spade a spade. I fully expect Cesaro to win here. I don't expect much in the way of follow-up. That's true. Maybe he gets enough of a push afterward because of Brian's influence on the SmackDown writing team. Maybe not. At least he'll have this, and he'll be wrestling with his bud, and they're going to put on a freaking hell of a show. I think that this is one of the better booked matches here. Seth Rollins, outside of his Royal Rumble appearance, targeted Cesaro immediately. They managed to not do it at Fastlane and save it for WrestleMania. And now they have a chance to create something really special. Cesaro deserves this moment for the people. I fully expect a swing of 100 times. I... I think Rollins has found a really good place in his career where he's no longer the burn it down fun guy, but he's not being like a serious messiah. He is fully tongue in cheek. I am the greatest thing that's ever happened. And I think that this is working better for him than the version of him that was fighting Kevin Owens for six months in 2019 and 2020. Hmm. I think uh, his outfit at WrestleMania will be ridiculous because he's really embraced that side of things. Maybe one of these two guys get a cool entrance. I don't know. I don't know how much they're doing this year in terms of entrance stuff. But this is one of the ones that I'm actually really looking forward to the most across both nights. I will go with Brian's winning. <laughs> really? <laughs> Do you think it's just gonna be one of those things where it's like, sorry, Cesaro, you still just can't break through that glass ceiling? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> I like how I go on for like five minutes about this dying tribe about like uh, I'm not all negative, everybody. <laughs> and Callum just goes, I'm gonna be the negative one for this part. <laughs> well I just don't care. But like, it's gonna be a good match, but I literally don't give give a shit about the feud. I don't care about Seth Rollins at all. I kind of wish he would go away, even though he's just come back <laughs> already. And I think that Rollins will just win and they all go off the Intercontinental Championship. There's not necessarily Cesaro needs to win or anything like that, but I just don't think Cesaro... If Cesaro wins this, he's not going to do anything. If Rollins wins... If Rollins loses, he'll do something and Cesaro will just be left anyway. So at the end of the day, it doesn't matter who wins this match. I just think they'll just give it to Rollins because it's Rollins. See, but that's exactly why I think they need to give it to Cesaro, because if Roll Rollins lost to Owens last year, and the very next night he's beating up Drew McIntyre and fighting for the championship the next month. I think they need to give it to Cesaro, even if they do nothing with him, just so they can go, hey, we book moments. That's Because that's the way I'm envisioning this entire two-night event. I am hoping, maybe foolishly, 
that there's at least somebody reasonable enough that can get this point across about we need to learn from our mistakes because this is a feud that ultimately doesn't really matter. But at the same time, with any of these matches at WrestleMania, they should lean more towards baby faces because the fans are going to be happier and you want the fans to be happy. It's all supposed to be about putting smiles on faces, right? Well, sometimes the heel winning is the best choice, even if people will be annoyed about it because that's telling a better story. And in a match like this, I don't think that the story element gets factored in beyond that. I think it's just a matter of like, let's just give them a pop because it's R01. So look at a match like Ryback versus Mark Henry from WrestleMania 29. Now, Ryback didn't work out all that well. Mark Henry, you know, former world champion and all that. I think he's underrated in some ways. I've made the case before that a ride back that year should have won the Royal Rumble and gone on to beat Big Show, WrestleMania, that kind of a thing. But whatever other, you know, on laundry list of different mistakes that comes along with that. One of the biggest ones is Ryback was an actual pretty decent deal at that time. And they decided they wanted to have Mark Henry win that match and then Ryback to do his move after the match. It did nothing for nobody. It was just a stupid decision. You can't do something like Seth Rollins wins. He just gets the win and then Cesaro swings him afterward. And then everybody goes, oh, well, you got both. You can't have your cake and eat it too like that. Because what's the harm of Rollins losing? He's fine. So don't split the difference. If you do you that, what, then people aren't going to enjoy it as much. And if it doesn't matter, if it's not going to lead to something like Rollins has to win because he's got something on the line or whatever, then just go with the thing that's the happiest, you know? Until you said that about, well, they can always just do what they did with Mark Henry and Ryback. You're, you're right. Like, I actually see that as a possibility now. That's what I'm afraid of. They could, and it could just be, oh, well, he swung him anyway, and isn't it great? No, he needs to win. Like, I think, and moreover, I think Rollins will argue that he needs to win. I'm and hoping think, that that's, like, the case, where he just goes, no, 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 I want to lose. <laughs> yeah. To be clear, because I think I'm the glass half full uh, guy right now, I think this is Cesaro's one moment. And then I don't think, I think he gets in the money in the bank, but he doesn't win that. And then we'll just kind of quietly be the uh, mid card babyface guy. But to spoil, he needs to win here. To spoil a prediction for me a little bit later on, I think he becomes one of the next Intercontinental Champions. But we'll get to that. Uh, so I'm going Cesaro. Rob, you're going Cesaro and Callum, you're going Rollins. Okie dokie, so let's go over to Bad Bunny and Damian Priest versus The Miz and John Morrison. It's been changed again back to a tag team match, which was the original plan, which I'm happy about because that means that Damian Priest can be in the majority of the match and he can hold down uh, the reins and make sure that this doesn't get like, too wacky. Bad Bunny has been training, supposedly, and putting in the effort, so that's cool. I still don't care about celebrity stuff because I don't care about celebrities. So I get it again, not going to fault WWE for trying to get media coverage. It's not my issue here. I don't think that bad bunny's song is all that great. Uh, it's, it's just my personal taste. I'm sure if they did something that I would care more about, I'd care more about it. Just the same as if they did something I care less about, I'd care less about it. So I fully give my like, Okay, this is this is good. Stamp of approval. It's not great. It's not the best thing ever. It's not something that 20 years from now we're going to be talking about this as being like the highlight. I really hope so. That this isn't the highlight of WrestleMania. But I do commend them for you got somebody who's a big deal right now in pop culture and you got him actually wrestling and you got him doing some stuff. You know, he's getting hit by guitars and whatever. So that's cool on Bad Bunny. And this is going to get a, a spot for Damian Priest, which is good. It's a shame that the Miz and John Morrison can't be taken more seriously. But then again, if they're cool with playing the kind of comedic characters, then 
at the very least, you got you can't make the argument against the idea that the Miz doesn't always have something to do. He always finds a way. I think, first of all, if they were going to do a tag team match, they should have just fucking announced the tag team match to begin with. I think that they were waiting on Morrison being cleared. Because remember, he got that injury. I still, I think it would have been a, a bigger swerve if you would have booked it as a tag match and then had Bad Bunny go, no, 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 I want you one-on-one if he can't go. But that's a small nitpick for me. I think it's very interesting that Miz and Morrison, who... Say what you want about WWE's tag division of the, you know, last two decades. They're one of the more standout teams, and this is going to be their first tag team match on a proper WrestleMania card. Because the Didn't only they? other match... Oh, the pre-show. There was on the pre-show of 25. Yeah. And then uh, last year, pandemic, so Morrison defended solo. Um, <laughs> good, for, good for Miz. Good for Bad Bunny. I like everything about this. I like everything about the setup here. Do I care about Bad Bunny that much? No, but I get it. Uh, he obviously needs to win. He should do like a crossbody or a frog splash or something. Yeah. And do, do something that he can do as long as it's good. And Morrison also has been in like two celebrity matches because he was teamed with Snooki. So <laughs> go Morrison. There's, there's a lot of cool stuff here. I think that Bad Bunny's done a very good job in his role, and he's been very committed to appearing with WWE throughout the entire time since the Royal Rumble. Yeah. So I think in terms of just overall celebrity appearances with WWE, he's really high up there in terms of his actual care and commitment to the the craft, if you want to call it that. And it's good that Damian Priest gets involved in the match because that'll make it better. Miz and Morrison will... Do the classic kill tag team stuff. They'll sell for Bad Bunny. They'll sell for huge for Damian Priest. And I think this is one of the matches where you could like, okay, this is the match to kind of bet the house on, really. Yeah. Because if there's there no one match that, that you can call, Damian. it's this one. <laughs> yeah, because there is no way that Bad Bunny and Damian Priest are losing here. So. And this is one of those things where, hey, look, if you're really not into this, you know where this is going. This is your sandwich match. This mm-hmm. is your soda match. For other people, this is the one they can't miss. Like, this is one of the few matches that's in the perfect spot on the card. It's Everything about it is good. This is the WrestleMania match that they used to have in the past where you can go, look, yeah, Damian Priest is not a world champion right now where it's like, you know, it's the Undertaker match where you're like, okay, this is one of the main events. And Miz and John Morrison, they, you know, they're higher up in some ways than this should realistically be or whatever, but it's a celebrity match. It's going to get them a lot of media coverage. Bad Bunny pinning Miz or Morrison is going to be something that gets passed around on different shows. Eventually we're going to be talking about WWE hall of Famer bad bunny because of this. And it's a good thing for anybody. that meant to make the argument of bad bunny is taking a spot on the card. Think about it this way. If bad bunny was replaced with ricochet, as great as Ricochet is, and I am fully, fully, fully going to support you in the argument that Ricochet should be a better deal, a uh, bigger deal than what he's been treated for the past, you know, however long he's been on the main roster. And yeah, I fully agree he should have a spot at WrestleMania and all that. If Ricochet teams up with Damian Priest, or if Angel Garza teams up with Damian Priest, or anybody who's awesome uh, teams up with Damian Priest instead, WWE does not book this match on the card. And it ultimately doesn't matter. Bad Bunny, as a celebrity, is the reason this match is happening. And somebody like a Damian Priest is going to get a good rub out of that. So it's a good thing. He's not taking a spot up in the sense that he's fighting for the world championship. It's okay. You know? (laughs) This is how I get people on both sides that hate me. Because people will go, yeah, you don't like Bad Bunny's song? And then I get other people that are like, ah, you think Bad Bunny's got a good spot? And then I'm like, I'm being realistic, guys. <laughs> it's funny to me that you mentioned he's not fighting for the world championship. He very very nearly could have if they would have kept it on the Miz. Yeah, could have been the case. I mean, we're in a world where um, David Arquette's a former WCW champion, so anything could happen. 
anything could happen in WWE. <sighs> yeah, that's really a great moment to try and bring up and replicate. Well, like, yeah, not that's saying it should. Like they're not totally doing WCW booking right now. Yeah. Of course they are. They're going to have Bad Bunny pin, well, depending on where the position is on the card and what happens in the Bobby Lashley Dream McIntyre match, Bad Bunny is going to pin the former WWE champion on this show. Yeah. So let's so, go over to... Oh, you had another thing you to say? Go ahead. I was just going to say, well, it just shows that the company's... The, the, the championship is a bit of a joke then. I know how yeah, they're, they're not in a, a good place right now. I will say, like, they're in desperate need of another breakout star like a Becky Lynch or a Steve Austin because they're not in a great place. Because yeah. you, you could make the argument saying, like, well, The Miz was he won by having everybody else beat up Drew McIntyre and cash in, so he's not a legitimate champion anyway. But then you could say, well, David Arquette didn't actually pin a wrestler to win the world title, he pinned Derek Bischoff. And so. Yeah. So, realistically, he could have won the world title that way, but it still doesn't make it any less of a joke. Yeah. We book moments, pal. <laughs> Wasn't that book, great we... when Miz uh, cashed in? They don't book moments, they book gifable memes. Yeah, they, yeah, they book things that can be on Giphy on Twitter. Yeah. I hate that that's like a real thing. Yeah. Another uh, rant for another day. Some 4 a.m. Uh, type of thing or 1 a.m. type yeah. of thing where you and I, I just kind of... Hot tags on Friday and <laughs> we just lose it. <laughs> where we're just like, all right, let's go home for WrestleMania. Just, ah! <laughs> just kind of... <laughs> Why did they change six things? <laughs> you know? Let's talk about the Raw Tag Team Championship. We got the New Days, Xavier Woods, and Kofi Kingston against AJ Styles and Omos or Omos or Almost or Edward James Omos, whatever it might be. They keep changing it every single week. I'm trying to track it, guys. <laughs> but Styles even pronounces it differently week to week. So it's like, goddamn. But uh, I think this is 100% going to Styles and Omos. I'm going to go with Omos as his name. I think that that's the bigger thing you can do even though the new day are the baby faces and i said i think that this should be baby face heavy a title change for somebody's debut and his tag team partner being one of the most popular people a phenomenal one you know is something that i think that they can get away with going with the baby face uh the baby faces losing if you keep the titles on the new day yeah people will probably pop but i think they'll pop more if you give it to styles and amas yeah, this is one of the matches. Uh, again, I think I'm looking forward more to night one than I am night two, because this is another one of those like I really want to see this. This should just be fun. Kofi's great. I know he was supposed to fight Ali, and maybe there was a way to do that, but I think this is actually better. Kofi's great. Woods is great. The New Day are such a fun act. AJ has really come into his own in WWE. Omos, he's big, which is good. You know, like, he's going to be an anomaly in that sense. Triple H called him a sponge about 15 times on the media call. So maybe he's, like, really good. Is that how you pronounce it, then? Instead of Omos, it's a sponge? (laughs) Perhaps. (laughs) But I think this is going to be really good. And, yeah, I think AJ Styles and Omos win the belts. So this is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for it. I mean, it's just ridiculous the way that this match is thrown together. And everyone's super excited because, oh, Omos is going in. I wonder why they haven't actually put him in a ring for the last two years or whatever. This seven foot plus tall guy. Why has he never actually wrestled? Because he's shit. And I think we're going to see at WrestleMania, he's shit. That, that there's no other reason why they wouldn't put him in the ring. Why have they put him in like a ninja and a bouncer to Raw Underground beforehand? Because he can't wrestle. And he probably can't wrestle. Probably not. Just, yeah, and that's and everyone still like, oh, it's super excited because it's AJ Styles and Omos. The reason why it's like, they're excited is because it's a team they haven't seen before. Yeah. And that's like, that's all you need at this point in, in WWE. So, oh, it's so exciting. It's just like two people that have never had tag team together before because every single person has fought every single person in this company multiple times over and over again. This is a match we haven't seen yet. So, we, yay, super excited. 
it doesn't mean that it's good. It doesn't mean that it's great that the New Day won the titles from the Hurt Business and then were just immediately challenged by AJ Styles and Omos and basically said, OK, we'll give you a match for the tag titles of WrestleMania, even though your tag team partner has never had a match at all. Can I go down to the ring and say that I want to fight for the tag team titles and they've got to accept it? I've never had a match before. Am I allowed to do that? A oh, 10 year old can. So. <laughs> it depends on whether or not you go dressed up like a cowboy. Um, <laughs> I just, so, I just don't, I just, I would have liked this to actually have had some sort of build up, or at least have have AJ Styles beat one of the members of the New Day and then gets the title shot, rather than have AJ Styles and Omos come out and challenge them for the title belt, and then AJ Styles loses three straight matches against the New Day in different uh, scenarios mm -hmm. after he went completely undefeated, besides that loss to Drew McIntyre in the Elimination Chamber match for about three or four months. Like they actually give him a feud and give him some direction to WrestleMania, and then they start beating him. So this I don't fucking sucks. Again, that's the type of thing I'm talking about about like <laughs> how you should approach the way that WrestleMania is booked. Like Calm's right, the setup for this kind of garbage because it's just New Day wins the titles from the Hurt Business, and then immediately afterward, it's like okay, well the, the match at WrestleMania is this one. They're getting into this habit of. The way you book WrestleMania is you wait until a couple weeks beforehand and people just say, I want WrestleMania match. Another one goes, K, okay. and that's not good. Setup for this is not good. The moment itself is all that they're going to care about. And that's not making an excuse for them because excuses should be yeah. exceptions, not the rule of thumb. Mm -hmm. But I do agree with the idea that the bigger moment is Styles and Amas winning. And yeah. That's if you if you tell me like I get hired from WWE today, so I can't go back in time and I can't replace the way that they've done ninety percent of this card, and you say okay, you've got the ability to influence WrestleMania. Where do you go here? I go. I put the titles on Styles and Amos. Yeah. So oh, to yeah. be to be clear, Callum is one hundred percent right, and if you listen to the podcast, was it however long ago it was when they announced the match? Tony and I were in shambles when they just like, <laughs> and the belts are switched, and here's AJ. You know, yeah, that's not great, but I'm I'm just hoping that AJ and Kofi and Woods have fun and kill it, and then the big guy comes in and does a squashy squashy, and it's just fun. <laughs> like, it's an easy fun match to book. And yeah, I agree with Callum completely. This is not how it should be. Quite frankly, AJ should have been factored in towards the top. And that's a different issue in and of itself because they completely... Uh, they have only certain guys they want to challenge for the belt. And AJ's becoming one of those guys where it's like, well, we'll give you a featured match like Undertaker, but Triple H can't do it this year. So uh, go for the tag titles. And I, again, I get it. But it should be better. That being said, it's still one of the ones I'm looking most forward to. And that's indicative of how badly this card has been booked. Yeah. I, I mean, I wouldn't mind as much if it wasn't like if about a quarter of the matches across both nights. I haven't just been, hey, I want to fight you at WrestleMania. Okay, let's do it. That sort of that's that, that's the build towards it rather than it being like a natural progression. If well, this was the one example of that, that match, then I'd be totally fine with it. So since both of you guys have brought that up now, I was going to save that for... Well, I guess we, we actually already did talk about the WWE Championship match. But this is the second year in a row that they've done that, where it's just, I want match. And ladies and gentlemen, it's happening. I don't like that at all. That's a scary, scary precedent, because you're setting the table for laziness. And going forward, you can just be lazy with the precedent of, well, I challenged for it, and he accepted, and that's that's bad. That's not WrestleMania. That's bad. Because if that's the case, why did Edge risk his life to go through the Royal Rumble when he could just say, I want match, and then go yeah. away? <laughs> yeah, there is no road to WrestleMania if the road to WrestleMania is a bunch of bullshit leading up to, I want match. <laughs> you know? And that's, but if you did it for one match on this card, for the two nights, I mean, then it wouldn't be as big of a problem, but even then it shouldn't happen for even one match. I, I, I know I, I know what I said earlier and stuff like that about the match. I don't want to come across like I'm overly burying Omos. I think he's got a lot of 
actual charisma and he's got chemistry with AJ uh, from a manager and heavy standpoint. Well, like a wrestler and his heavy standpoint, they actually have some good chemistry between them. And if almost does perform well in the ring, then obviously uh, hold my hands up and say that I was wrong. But I haven't seen any evidence. And from what I've heard from people who have referenced his stuff in like the performance center and stuff like that, uh, sponge is not the word that I would uh, describe it. I would describe it as brick. <laughs> In terms of its ability, his ability to soak up wrestling knowledge and ability. So he's, uh, look, uh, Brick can be a sponge in a very tight situation, I'm sure. Uh, look, I don't know. Obviously, this dude has not had time to perform because he was just getting to the house show circuit when the world shut down and there's no more house shows. Yeah, and th- like his first match is going to be in front of 25,000 people. Yeah, it's. Look, it's it's a little scary, but he's got the best performer in the company to cover him. Who does a better yeah, I, job, Omas or Bad Bunny? Bad Bunny. I, I would. Uh, I don't know. Look, if it is Bad Bunny is better than Omos, then that performance center needs to be burned to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> And that's what Seth Rollins should be doing, I guess. <laughs> this is my favorite version of Callum <laughs> well, I mean, I'm just saying, it's just that how, how can you get into a situation where you've had this guy for about two or three years and you bring in one celebrity who, who his first move that he ever did in a WWE ring was a crossbody there. He almost killed himself. And like, he'll probably have a better, if he has a better performance in it than almost this seven foot tall plus monster guy, then there's clearly something wrong with the way they're training their people. They even have a big man class, and if he can't do that well in that, then I don't know. Like, take, he can have a perfectly good, solid career as a heavy if his if this match goes badly. You know who he'd be uh, perfect in? That big man buffet match that I always want them to do. <laughs> and if you like big man buffets, you should watch Godzilla vs. Kong, which Tony and I did a review of. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to see two heavies just smashing the crap out of each other and all that, we did do that fan track. So go to fanboysanonymous.com, check that out, subscribe to that YouTube channel, ring that little notification bell, hit up the Patreon for fanboys if you want us to do more things like that. And like you said, uh, during that fan tracks, if you want us to watch more of the Godzilla stuff or the Kong stuff or any of those kind of things, if you think that there's a funny movie that like Rob and I would do a good audio commentary track on, you have to pick your poison tier where you can always request it. So keep that in mind, everybody, and uh, show some love over to the blue brand over there. You know, it's not just on Friday nights. It's any time that we can do something on the fanboy spectrum, uh, including the Mount Rushmore of Batman villains that we most recently did. Thank you to Guest 5 for sponsoring that episode. We still have uh, two, three more matches on night one to talk about. Steel Cage match, Braun Strowman versus Shane McMahon. More and more and more, I am fully on board with what Wago had said in our uh, group chat, where Shane McMahon's winning this, and he's going to win it because Braun Strowman is going to do something stupid, wherein he's going to toss Shane McMahon either through the cage, or what I think is more likely to happen, Shane McMahon's going to be climbing on the outside of it, and Strowman is going to throw him down through the uh, commentary table, and that'll be one of their moments, like what we talked about with the Cesaro swing with Ryback and Henry type of thing, where it's like, yeah, well, Braun Strowman lost, but he got to do the thing that he wanted to do, which was to beat the crap out of Shane McMahon. So that way, Shane McMahon can come out on Raw and go, Braun was stupid, and I won the match, and that was stupid of you to do that. And then they can get another match out of it if they want to. Last man standing match at Money in the Bank. And they'll do that kind of thing where they'll probably have the whole locomotive thing before the match starts because I don't know why they would have booked these two to be in the thing where they're stuck in the middle of the ring instead of having the ability to go around and the you know maximize their potential. But I think it's because in their mind, the steel cage and that one spot is good enough. We'll do the actual fighting with weapons at Money in the Bank. Or they might not even bother to do that. They might just drop it, you know? I think just to give an alternative big man ending, if Shane is already out, I can see Braun either just ripping 
the side that he's on off and throwing him through the cage or doing the train move and smashing through the cage. But since they'll do the Roman thing with Brock, where it'll be like Shane's feet hit the floor, it'll be something to the point where Shane gets to go, you're stupid, ha ha, hee hee. Ha ha, hee hee, Miss and Mars. <laughs> like, and by the way, and I've heard this on several podcasts, and look, I get what they're going for. Where I've been called stupid my whole life, and I dedicate this match to anybody who's called stupid. Look, Braun, you're huge. You're in the world that you should have the biggest advantage in. Don't tell me that some 50-plus-year-old rich dude is bullying you. You're a grown-ass man. Go kill him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if, Fucking... yeah, if you don't like it, Braun, you can make a good earning on the independent circuit. Oh, no, I... Um... <laughs> <laughs> I'm a staunch supporter of Ron Strowman. I'll say that. I mean, well, to be fair, I was, too. And then they've turned him into completely, he's just going to be the big man. Yeah. Who is kind of lame. And this is the epitome of that. So, yeah, Shane wins. I don't care. I almost said, until I remembered this match, this would have been the first WrestleMania in years without a part-timer. But they had to get Shane on the card. And I think, like, that's ridiculous. I... I understand why they've gone with the steel cage thing because it gets the ending that we've already kind of danced around, which is the idea that Braun will do something that causes Shane to hit the ground first in some sort of painful way, which sheds another year off of his life. Already. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the issue, the bigger issue that I have, rather than that just being the result and the fact that the feud will continue beyond this point, is the fact that we're inside a steel cage, which means these two have to have a match. Yeah, that's what I'm getting at before. Like, these two are not the type of people you lock inside of the steel cage. These are the two that you let go around the arena and beat the crap out of each other with weapons. Yeah, and you know what's even the worst part about all of that is the fact that Braun is going to have to sell for Shane McMahon. Those punches. (laughs) He's going to have to just... Shane's going to attack the leg or something, and Braun has got to sell for this 50-something-year-old man in 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 a football jersey or whatever, a baseball jersey or whatever it is. Dancing around the ring, they could get right there. Ridiculous! His face beat like his face beaming like a giant red flashlight. It's like that police yeah. siren going <laughs> off. He feels bad about making fun of uh, Mr. Miz. Is in his face after seeing what his face is starting to look like. Because Shane's getting red, and I'm a little concerned. I'm gonna be honest. Yeah, his, his face going beat red. The beads of sweat coming down his face. The feeling slowly losing out of his left arm before he taps it correctly, to just, <laughs> just to get it working again. They can't do a crimson mask anymore. This is the closest thing. Yeah, and but that's that's the most painful. Thing. I think this could very easily be the worst match on the entire the entire WrestleMania week. I can see that. Out, outside of the one we're going to talk about on night two, <laughs> depending on how it goes. But we'll talk about that. Yeah. Well, but, but um, but yeah, I just think that this is gonna be bad because like, Braun Strowman can't exactly carry with, with the right opponent. Braun Strowman can have good matches, and even with, and Shane Man with the right opponent can have good matches. These two aren't the people that you put together and expect to have a good match out of it. They're like the people that you put alongside someone who's actually good. I'm and hoping it's quick. Be. He won't be. They'll drag it out. <laughs> out. There's only seven yeah. matches on this card. They'll drag it out. I bet this one goes at least 15 minutes. Yeah. Well, it also depends on how long they want WrestleMania to go, because it starts at 8, right? Yeah, that's another thing we haven't talked about. I don't like that. I like, would rather it start at 7, and for them to have a 6.30 pre-show, and to just, we, again, add one more match onto the card and do it, that kind of a thing. But We were getting so used to, like, hey, look, it's 9.30, and we're almost done. <laughs> yeah, that ain't happening on Sunday, or Saturday. Or, or Sunday, for that matter. I would say the likelihood, you know, the train noise thing. I think that will happen at the start of the match, and Braun will just take out both Jackson Riker and Elias on the outside of the ring. That will allow Shane McMahon to hit him with the door and then begin to uh, make him sell. Yeah. And he'll start climbing and do stuff like that, and you'll be trying to outsmart him constantly. I just, yeah, I'm not looking forward to this as a match. 
that Shane has proven me wrong at WrestleMania in the past. I just was kind the... of wished. I just kind of wish he would look after himself. Was it the Miz one? On the Miz, but I thought I liked the Miz match. Yeah, the Miz one was really good. But then again, they were allowed to move all around the arena to do that, so you can kind of hide true. the fact that they're they're both limited in certain ways. Do you guys think and that the, the follow up match you... happens? Do you think it happens at Money in the Bank, or do you think more so what I'm starting to think now? The follow up match happens on the Raw after WrestleMania. Either way, they're doing a follow up. I think it'll be Money in the Bank, but I can see it being on the Raw after Mania. I think they're doing multiple follow ups. Of this match? Yep. I think the next match they'll have is a three on one handicap match. Can Callum is banned from talking. <laughs> <laughs> Whether that's, yeah. on, whether that's not after WrestleMania or anything like that, I think the next match they'll have is Braun Strowman versus Shane McMahon, Jackson Ryker, and Elias. And then Braun will kill all of them somehow, and then that will lead to the last man standing. Could be. Now, I want to save the main event for the main event, but let's talk about this one. Um, the tag team turmoil match. Natalia and Tamina, Lana and Naomi, the Riot Squad, and Sexy Muscle Friends. Dana Brooke and uh, Mandy Rose. At the very least, those four teams, but there's also maybe... Can we just talk about Billy no, like, don't say maybe. The fuck, well, they put them in the graphic, Tony. They put them in the graphic. It's Billy Kay and Carmella, and they teased that they could be doing something last week, and they teased something on Raw, but they, for some reason, just haven't gone ahead and added that. So more than likely, they're going to add them on SmackDown, and have a whole thing where it's like, this just in, we also added this team because we like doing the whole give you something else to do. So I'm personally treating it as if those two are wrestling in the match. And it's weird because Bailey isn't. So maybe they do something like what Rob was mentioning about. Maybe they go with Billy Kay and Carmella, but then even on WrestleMania, they switch it up and they go with Bailey and Carmella, and it's like, uh, ding dong, hello, I'm actually in the match, that kind of a thing or something. Because it is yeah, a little bit weird that Bailey's got out. nothing, right? Bailey deserves something. Bailey carried the company through the bulk of the pandemic, and damn it, she deserves a match at WrestleMania in front of people. She was champion for like a year and three quarters or something. And and the people, do you realize how much that's going to get over in front of a crowd? If she can go ding dong and they can go, hello, you know, like that's, you got to do that in front of people. I'm expecting something like that to happen. And that already is something that, again, you can discuss all the time about like, well, you know, does Bailey need to have a match on the card? Well, she should because she's one of the biggest deals in the company with the women's division or whatever. And, some of the other people aren't having a match. Like Charlotte Flair doesn't have a match right now. Maybe they add her into the mix. I hope not. Nikki Cross is like, God, I just want to wrestle. Can you just do something? And I maintain my argument. This should not be two matches. This should be the tag titles are on the line in a battle royal. And you can incorporate all these teams in the best case scenario, and this is the type of thing that, again, if I were to have gotten some kind of a position with writing WWE, this is the type of stuff that I would have pushed like a few weeks ago. I'd have been like, look, can we just admit breaking up the Iconics is a bad idea and it didn't work out for either of them in the grand scheme of things? And can we have Bailey and Carmella team up? Can we have like Nikki Cross and Mia Yim team up? Yeah, it doesn't matter. But at the same time, if it doesn't matter, just do it. Give them a paycheck. Let them have fun. Remind them that they're a part of the company and not people that you just don't care about. Because that's that can go a long way with morale. And teaming up Nikki Cross and Mia Yim, you have one backstage segment. You don't even need to have it on the air because you've got Twitter and you've got YouTube. So you have one... They sound like they don't know. They know. They, they know, but that's... I'm, I'm reminding them. They have... One segment backstage for a minute and a half where Mia Yim is backstage and Nikki Cross says, hey, Sonya Deville has made this because, uh, hey, look at that. Sonya Deville is an authority figure. Maybe you can factor her in there. Sonya Deville has decided that the tag team titles are on the line in a battle royal because Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler say that they've beaten everybody and that this is the only way that like they would have a challenge. 
and that there's like a free reign kind of a thing. You know how Kofi Kingston re uh, recently mentioned about Styles and Amos that they weren't registered as a tag team. They brought up this idea that there's like a registry. Just be like, Sonya Deville decided that it's an open registry. You seem like you can cause some chaos. I'm Nikki Cross. I used to be Insanity or whatever. You want to team up, then we can just go fuck some shit up. And then they'd go, cool. There you go. You got a tag team in there. Like, it's not hard. And then you reform the Iconics. And if you want people to pop super crazy, the Iconics win the tag team battle royal and they win the titles and everybody goes nuts and stuff. But we're not getting that. Instead, we're getting splitting the difference so that there's two matches that people don't care about and less room for like the SmackDown tag titles to have gone on this card or something that would have made a lot more sense. Because if you want to buy into the idea that they said the reason why they did this is because they wanted to cut down on the time and they didn't think they had enough time for WrestleMania. Why do you have two of these matches? You don't need the tag team turmoil match. As it is, that's happening. Either Billy Kay and Carmella are in it or Bailey and Carmella or whatever they happen to do. I'm going the Riot Squad wins this and I'm, I'm just going to skip ahead. Night two, Riot Squad wins the titles. I... I'm on board with the Riot Squad wins the titles, but I'm not really. They well, it doesn't fuck it. Ugh. Tony. They have belts that go across three brands, and they split them yeah. into another belt just because they didn't want to do that thing where they go across three brands like they said they would. But you're not going to um, hear me make that argument of, but it doesn't matter. You know, I'm always going to say it could be better. Here's how it could potentially be better. People will pop for Naomi. Do you just give it to Naomi and Lana? Just look like people will go nuts for Naomi. If Ravish and Glow or the Riot Squad win, especially if they win the tag titles, some people will pop. Because there's people, I mentioned this in our chat yesterday, people are, some like Liv Morgan obsessive fans are trying to make the argument that this should be the co-main event and it's like oh, come on guys co-main event of uh, tony <laughs> well you, this doesn't make any sense of what like it's well in their in their mind it's thing. like oh well you know the main event should be the whatever it is so and it then the... yeah but it's but they're in their minds it's like i love Liv morgan she should be headlining because she's absolutely amazing that's not a slight on Liv morgan i like Liv morgan but be a little bit more realistic, guys. I'm a huge fan of... Uh, I mentioned earlier, I like Akira Tozawa. I'm not putting him in the world title picture. It's just realistic, you know? But Yeah. So, I... You gotta go Glow or Squad. I'm Unless you go, go with squad, Bailey and Carmella and you do that whole thing. But, but you know. I'd be alright with going Glow. Are you going with them winning the titles too, or are you going with Jackson oh, Baszler yeah, retaining? Absolutely, Jackson Baszler should not walk out of WrestleMania with the belt. It's whoever wins this match will win the belts, and I'm going with uh, Glow. Go. Team up Charlotte Flair and Bailey and have them win. Hell yeah! I like his idea. <laughs> <laughs> like, like he's right. Like that's a, that's an option. I don't see any other option. It's an option. Oh my god, that's great! Yeah, that's It'd be a way to get them on the card, that's for sure. <laughs> I don't think that's, that's something revolutionary. I feel like that's what like fifty percent of people are pretty much saying. It's just like Bailey deserves to be on WrestleMania. Charlotte is clear to wrestle WrestleMania. Just team them together. I know it doesn't really make sense because Charlotte is well, she's a baby face who people hate, and Bailey's a heel. Right now, people that people love. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, but that's the point. Like, it's just you can make them both baby. They would both be baby faces over Shayna Baszler, and especially over Nia Jax. You know what? And I'll I'll go an extra step further to back up this theory. They can go on both shows. Mm -hmm. Tell me you wouldn't want Charlotte Flair and Bailey on both programs. Yeah. See, that's I, where the writing team should be doing things because look out of even if it's just the three of us booking this card Callum brings up an idea that honestly I didn't think of and I'm like that'd be the coolest thing that'd be cooler than the Riot Squad winning because the Riot Squad can always just win the titles another time and at least they're performing at WrestleMania and whatever but you you tell me that that's the case cool you know absolutely I, <laughs> I don't agree. think it's happening though <laughs> well, yeah I mean just throw some the caveat 
I want to add to this is that they win the tag team titles and then they're a tag team. And by what I mean is Charlotte does not go after the Raw Women's Championship after WrestleMania. Bailey does not go after the SmackDown Women's Championship after WrestleMania. They are a tag team. They are tag team champions. They lose to a tag team and then they can do whatever they want in the singles division. That is what I would say about that because there has been too much cross pollination between the women's world championships and the women's tag team championships. I'm done. I want them separate. I think we gotta um, start doing these earlier because Callum is just. I like this Callum. It's very good Callum. Great ideas. A lot of fire. I like doing these. So that would be my main option. Realistically, I don't like any of the people. And it's not I don't like any of the people. Like they're fine, but like I don't feel strongly connected enough to any of the tag teams that'll be wrestling on this to want to have any of them have their own match at WrestleMania for the Women's Tag Team Championships. I mean, apparently there was the idea initially that I think Fightful, Fightful Select put out there about the idea that um, they were supposed to be the... They were going to do the quote-unquote WrestleMania 15 Battle Royal that they did, where essentially two people... It would just be a, a straight-up Battle Royal, and whoever were the last two women left would team together to take on Nia Jax and Jaina Baszler. But I think when they did it at WrestleMania 15, it was Test and D'Lo Brown team together to take on uh, Jeff Jarrett and Owen Hart. Yep, that did happen. I don't know why, but it did. Yeah. So that would have been a good way of getting Charlotte and Bailey to team together without it with it without it like obviously it wouldn't yeah. quite unquote make sense, but it would be a better way to put it together. The fact they aren't doing it makes me a bit skeptical that they won't do that. But if that's not the case, then I would just start fantasy booking with can we get the Bella twins to do the thing yeah. instead? Can we get can we get Molly Holly and Beth Phoenix to team up and do it? Now I, I would literally said... look at anybody. I would, and it sounds bad, but I would look everywhere else except the four teams that the four or five teams that are currently announced for this thing. <laughs> That's how much I don't care about this women's tag team division. Now I had said in quite a few places that I fully think if you've got nothing else, put it on the bellows. Now I don't know if they like are cleared or if they're just willing to do it that quickly because I know they'd, so they'd want to be fully immersed in it but the Bellas will get a fucking pop in front of people and if you want to take yep. that mentality of there's people ain't nobody more popular than the Bella Twins love Naomi love Liv Morgan nobody is more popular than the Bellas if they're available do it I don't want the Bella Twins in the ring with Nia Jax but I think Nia Jax will also L- likes <laughs> them enough that she would take care of them so that nothing bad happens. Is that the match that you were talking about, Callum? That, that could be the worst match of the card? <laughs> the no. Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler versus whoever wins? No. Actually, I'm surprised about that. I thought that that's where you were going to go with uh, with that. So I don't think it would be particularly good whoever they end up facing with, but that's why I want it to be Charlotte and Bailey, because Charlotte and Bailey are probably the two best women's workers that they have that aren't already booked on the card. Yeah, for that matter, Riot Squad against Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler, we've seen it. It's not going to be great. To the certain portion of the audience, and let's just be honest, this is true, to a certain portion of the audience, they will think that it's great just because it's a women's tag team title match, and a certain portion of the audience is going to be happy just because it's Liv Morgan or just because it's Naomi or, just, you know, whatever. Just because some people, I'm not that type of person. I'm not the guy that's like, hey, I do. I am a big fan of Braun Strowman. That doesn't mean that I'm going to go, oh, my God, he's got a steel cage match. It's going to be the best match of the night. Realistic, guys. Come on. So, like, well, let me ask you this. Let's skip ahead tonight, too. Does Nia Jax do a my whole bit in front of a crowd? I don't think so. I think that they've no. already gone past that. Yeah, I think I think they're done with it, which is to their credit, because they usually they didn't. I mean, they beat it into the ground already, but that's because it was a bad bit, and it wouldn't have survived two weeks anyway. But it's just at least they've decided. Yeah, we're not going to carry on with that. If Vince would have found it funnier, this would have been a my whole something something gimmick match. <laughs> that's how they would have done it. Ah, uh, all right. Um. The main event, though, of night two, I would... Night one. Yeah, night, uh, night one. I'm looking at my night two list right now. Uh, you could pretty much bet the farm that it's going to be Sasha Banks versus Bianca Belair. And as I mentioned before, this has been an absolutely, utterly atrocious feud 
for two people that deserve so much better because Banks is great and Bianca Belair is great and they're going to have a great match if the chemistry works because two great people in the ring doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be the best in the world. It's more than likely it probably will be, but sometimes it doesn't work out and it's kind of strange. But just because if they have a good match does not mean that this was a good feud. This has been absolutely terrible because it's revolved around Carmella's wine guy and the tag team titles over the course of two extra pay-per-views. And it's essentially boiled down to Banks poses and says, I'm the best. And Bianca goes, girl, uh, uh, it's shit. And you shouldn't be happy about how you booked it, but I'm a huge fan of both. And I am honestly a little nervous that Banks is going to retain. No way in hell. They already look, broke. Look at they how they've booked some up. of these. Almost every WrestleMania has had one of those championships go. Well, okay, it's got to go this direction. Then they go, what? Why did they? What? Almost every single year in the past couple of years. But no, like you just. They've already pushed it by having Sasha be champion this long. Sasha's never championed for a long time. Just put it on Bianca and do the right thing. I think it's unlikely that Sasha will win this match. I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility. Yeah, I'm still That's going right. Belair, but I, I'm nervous that they're that in their mind they're going to go. But wouldn't it be such a fun swerve if Banks won? You know. Isn't it too yeah, obvious that Bianca oh Belair won the, the thing and whatever? Wouldn't that be too obvious? Like, in what in what line of work do they go? Wouldn't it be great if people were miserable? <laughs> <laughs> only <laughs> only in professional wrestling. That's it. Like it's fucking annoying. Oh, wouldn't it be great if no? Right. Do what you have to do here. Yeah. If there's like, any reason that's factored into this, Bianca Belair wins the cha the championship. Like. And Sasha should have been a full-blown heel because then Bianca gets cheered more because there's going to be a portion of the fans that are just like, I want the boss to win because she's not a full-blown heel yet, you know? Well, let's be honest. They're the throw, and this is why they're going to get away with their bullshit line of, wasn't that a great moment? Because throw reason out the window here. You're going to get Sasha stands that just want to see Sasha win. You're going to get people that are just stoked to see two black women in the main event of WrestleMania. And at the end of the day, they're going to tell whatever story they want to tell in their minds. Yeah, ultimately, the story that they want to tell, the revisionist history of this whole thing is how that's going to work, because it'll be historic. They'll they'll say, you know, this is the first time ever the two black women were made of any WrestleMania, which is crazy to think that that's the case. But then again, you know, um, that's a positive in one way. And if they have a great match, they'll say, wasn't that match great? And wasn't this this historic, great, wonderful, perfect thing? You got to remember that the feud leading up to it was crap. And you can't give them a pass for that because if it ultimately hinges on Banks and Belair have to have a really good match to save how bad this was booked, that's not something that you can commend WWE for. That's WWE failing and the performers making up for it. So keep that in mind, everybody. I don't want to be hearing about this whole, like, Banks and Belair was this amazing feud, if that's the case. Because it wasn't. Admit it. You know. I am ultimately going Belair needs to win, should win, hopefully will win. But I have to admit, there's a portion of me that's like, I don't trust him. You know? <laughs> Look, I did a I'm whole thing go. back in the past of... Braun Strowman obviously has to win this championship right now, and they gave it to Brock Lesnar, and I was just like, "What the hell?" Like, you know, kind of. So I'm gonna go with Belair needs to win, should win, has to win, and will win. Yeah, I would also go with Bianca Belair winning as well, and I don't necessarily think this needed to be heel versus face going into it. I was totally fine with a face versus face match. And Sasha to work heel during the match a little bit more because the veteran over the rookie thing. I just wish it had been. Honestly, I wish it hadn't been as booked overbooked as it was. That's yeah. the bigger issue. It should have just been simple. 
we were talking ahead of time that you could have just gotten away with that WrestleMania 12 type of thing of just like, oh, this one's great, this one's great, they're going to have a great match, and here they are training. Like, they could have gotten away with that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. They should have just done that rather than, can they always coexist? Because for yeah. some reason, the people that fight for World Titles WrestleMania have to tag team with each other, build, building up to it. That's been almost every single thing this time around, hasn't it? They did it with Asuka and Rhea Ripley this week. They've done it twice for Bianca and Sasha. And they did it uh, in NXT, I think, recently too, didn't they? Yeah, they did the Finn Balor yeah, and Karrion Cross. And... Yep. Mm. So they just really love that for some reason. There's like eight stories. Come on, guys. <laughs> Let's go over to night two, though. We already talked about the Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler match, so that one's out of the way. Let's talk about what match we think is going to be the first match on night two. What do you guys expect? Asuka versus Rhea Ripley. That would be a great way to start, actually. Until then, I was thinking the drum fight, but... Yeah, Oscar I thought the Ripley. drum fight would go somewhere. My, my two choices for that would be Oscar versus Rhea Ripley or Kevin Owens versus Sami Zayn. I'm leaning more towards Oscar and Rhea Ripley, and yeah, I think that part of the reason why is because I do think that Rhea Ripley is winning that championship, and that's another way to kick off with another title change. Again, I'm going to reiterate stuff I've said a bunch of times, so I apologize, but. Asuka has been a sideliner for this entire year, and it's a shame because she is better than that. But WWE has made it abundantly clear if they put the title on her, they do not care. And in their mind, she's holding the belt, so it doesn't matter if we don't focus on her because the belt makes her relevant. And she's Asuka, which is like, we did one thing with Asuka, and there you go, that's all that matters. And I've said it for the past year, Rhea Ripley should not have dropped that championship to Charlotte Flair and they especially should not have had an entire year's worth of Rhea Ripley not winning a damn thing just to set her up to be the runner-up at WrestleMania for uh, the Royal Rumble and then wait until the last minute when you go, well, I guess we can't do that stupid Charlotte Flair versus Asuka match that really would have sucked anyway. It would have been a fine match, but the match would have been like, why are you doing this? And then... Just for Rhea Ripley to say, again, I want match, and Asuka to say, got it, and then now they've decided, well, Rhea Ripley's the heel, which is like, damn it, damn it, you're screwing up Rhea Ripley so much. So they at least have to give her the championship, unfortunately, at the expense of Asuka. And the fact that she's a heel now means... They're probably going to do the thing that I hate, which is eventually Charlotte Flair is going to beat her for that and make it to where Rhea Ripley just cannot beat Charlotte Flair. So I'm not looking forward to that. I think this is extremely poorly set up for both of the women in this match. They both deserve significantly better. This match could have been amazing and it could have been set up in an amazing way. And they botched an entire year for both of them. So that sucks. Give it the yeah. belt to Ripley. That's the least you could do at this point. And you're going to screw it up Look, afterward, too. This is my complete, I don't care. Just do the right thing and we won't have a problem. I hope they have a good match. But put this belt on Ripley and we won't have a problem. And that's all I really have to say about this match. Not a shame. Yes. I think the match itself will probably be very good because... I think Asuka works well with people that will give her a physical match, and Rhea Ripley seems to be the type that will do that. So I think the match will be pretty physical. I think Rhea Ripley had one of the better matches of the previous WrestleMania, so I've got no doubt she can do the same thing with Asuka that she did with Charlotte the previous year. The previous year. Um, this time, I think Rhea Ripley needs to win, and because if they've made her a heel, means that that'll probably be the case. If I was to take a more optimistic stance on it, which again is dangerous territory when you talk about WWE booking, but the hope is that Rhea Ripley just tears through the women's roster on Raw for a little while, building up to a SummerSlam match with Becky Lynch. That's yeah. probably yeah. That should. That I should... hear what you're saying. That SummerSlam match against Charlotte Flair will be great. <laughs> yeah, it will. No, no, no. Charlotte what are you talking about? That SummerSlam match of Charlotte Flair versus Becky Lynch. <laughs> you know what though. Fuck it, they're stars, and if that was the case, I'd be like, hell yeah, they can headline SummerSlam. Becky Lynch being back would be nothing but a positive. 
really, realistically, at the end of this, Saskia will lose the championship. She'll probably get a rematch or two against Rhea Ripley going forward. But then beyond that point, she'll become a tag team with Nikki Cross <laughs> and or Io Shirai when they call Io Shirai up. And then, um, yeah, by that point, Rhea Ripley will just be working away through the roster for a little bit. I think this is an opportunity to give the Raw Wounds division a bit of a reset like a hard reset and just say, okay, Rhea Ripley as a heel is our women's champion. Just build the division around her for a little while. And then once we decide that, that's why I kind of want Charlotte Flair to, and Bailey to win the tag team thing, because it keeps Charlotte out of the women's title. Well, it should, it won't, but it should keep Charlotte out of the women's title picture for at least a little while until maybe SummerSlam or just around about that time. So you can start building towards that match rather than, like that needs to happen straight away after WrestleMania. We immediately have to go into the Charlotte Flair direction. And that means that Rhea can have some feuds with Shayna Baszler because she's freed up now from the thing. And well, obviously, actually, she's a heel as well. But it depends what you want to do with Rhea Ripley. I think Rhea Ripley should will probably be a heel, and that means you'll probably be fighting people like Naomi and Mandy Rose for the women's title. Mm hmm. Because they don't have any strong baby faces. <laughs> that groan from Tony just. Well, they, just, yeah. they don't have they don't have any strong, like female baby faces. All the more reason why she shouldn't be a heel. That's true, but it's not like they're gonna make Oscar heel. No, but they shouldn't have had Oscar versus Rhea Ripley. They should have had Rhea Ripley beat Charlotte Flair, well, we, and well, that means not, that they we, should have had the title on Charlotte Flair earlier to make that be the case. Well, we know well we know that this isn't the match they wanted. The match they wanted was Charlotte Flair versus Lacey Evans. Which I mean, come on. <laughs> like that is just like, come on, guys, you know. Why would that be is... the match? That's think, insane it... though, when you think about that. It was so Charlotte Flair, Lacey Evans turns into Rhea Ripley Asuka. I think that's better. I think we get the better end of that deal. Yeah, this is the way that um again SRS describing it is like this is this was option D for them. Yeah. And it seems like it be... should be an option A type of thing, because look at the two. At the very least, option B. I was always of the opinion, Lacey at Fastlane and then Ripley versus Charlotte at Mania. I was fully of the belief that Ripley would fight for the role in the title at Mania. I just thought it would be Charlotte. I also thought you know... that on this episode of Raw that they were going to have Charlotte come back and be like, it's a triple threat. I kind of hope so. Just not because I don't think the match would have been improved or anything like that. I just feel like, well, selfishly, she's on my fantasy team, so I wanted her to be involved <laughs> in some capacity. But then also, I just feel like it would make more sense than this. Yeah, but like, I already saw them in a three-way with a Joshi wrestler that's maybe a little better than Asuka. I didn't necessarily want to see a repeat of In Your House. And then somebody on the creative team, probably Vince, or... Whoever, I don't know. I don't know who argues these kind of points, but guaranteed somebody on that team would have been like, it was NXT. Nobody pays attention to it. And it was a year ago. And then he'd be like, damn it, but you're supposed to pay attention to it. Like, that's the point. Like, you know. I'm pretty sure if there was anybody but Vince, if Triple H heard the words, nobody pays attention to it, he'd want that person gone. Like, yeah. Well, I mean, that's that person should be gone. Like, you're never going to hear that kind of a, an argument from me. I'd be the guy that would be like, Hey, so what are we doing on 205 Live this week? And they'd laugh at me and I'd be like, but it's a show, damn it. Like, you know, kind of like, hey, guys, can we put main event on the show's page so people know that it exists and we can tell you what time to watch it? And they'd be like, no. And I'd be like, well, OK, well, that just makes perfect sense, right? I'm just going to I'm going to order my food and throw it in the garbage before I eat it, too, while I'm at it. <laughs> like, <yeah. laughs> There's a bit of snack talk for the week. I don't know. Uh. Yeah, it's just it's the way the cookie crumbles, I guess. There's more I'm going Rhea. We're all going Rhea, right? Yeah. It has to be. Well, it doesn't. That, it doesn't. It, <laughs> Nothing it, has it, to be it, anything. It, it, I mean, this could be... God, imagine if they end up doing that kind of a WrestleMania. Where everything is like... Like, we look at like some of the matches we had talked about. It's like, Bobby Lashley and Drew McIntyre fight to a draw. So nobody's happy. Banks beats Bel Air. New Day uh, 
get squashed in a minute by just Omas and Styles doesn't even wrestle. Miz and Morrison win. And they end up doing this whole long thing as Rollins beats Cesaro and they just end up being like, ha ha ha, we got the fucking fans to boo. Like, you know, that kind of a thing. <laughs> We've had pay-per-views in the past that have been like, okay, they purposely booked this to troll people. Like the entire card is just like that. I don't think that this is going to be the case. It better yeah, not be. You can't do that with the one mania you have in front of people, though. It better not be. <laughs> Unfortunately, we got some other matches that we have to talk about here. One of them being Randy Orton versus The Fiend. It's not even a gimmick match. There it is. Yeah. That's the worst one. Yep. So if you enjoyed the fact that they already fought at WrestleMania a couple years ago and their big gimmick for their match at WrestleMania a couple years ago was projecting something on the mat, well, here you go. They're having a rematch from not just at WrestleMania, but also from TLC, and it took them five months to get, six months to get around to this point of a match. I hate being right about this Bray Wyatt thing. Now, I hate Ryan. you. Hold on, no. <laughs> I, I hate him because I feel like he really just spoke it into existence, as they say. Why couldn't they put them in a, in anything? This should not have been a feud for WrestleMania to begin with. Why the hell are they having this feud again? And if you want to make the argument of, oh, because we had such great ideas. You did? I didn't see them. The great ideas were Orton pukes up black sludge a couple weeks alexa bliss is on a swing set alexa stop <laughs> and uh, the whole idea of dragging this out it's it's the seth rollins and kevin owens thing again god damn it like i've been saying for months i don't want this to go to wrestlemania it's not gonna be good it's not gonna be worth it here we are it's not even a firefly fun house match and I think that's why this is the one match where the fans actually heard it. Because they're going to say that isn't it good enough that they're wrestling. When this is the one match that needs to be a cinematic match. It needs to be a Firefly Funhouse. It needs to be what Callum described last month, which is just pulling apart Randy Orton's career. This does not need to be nothing. And oh, they have a, they have a match. And what's worse will be if they tried to instill some Firefly Funhouse elements in front of a live crowd. So like, uh, it's Bray Wyatt's entrance and it's actually the Nexus music because here's Husky Harris. And then it's like, up, oh, just kidding. He's actually Bray Wyatt. Up, oh, just kidding. He's actually The Fiend. Just kidding. You know, like, keep going in that direction. Supply some sort of devil's advocate here. We don't, even though it says on the card right now it's a singles match, it doesn't mean we're getting a singles match. No. I mean, they could do that kind of crap where they just go, surprise, it's whatever. Or they could even just do the kind of thing where they go, it's a singles match, but we're doing all the bullshit anyway. Yeah. So that might add some element to it that would be interesting. But to be honest, this feud has been absolute garbage and the thing character as an overall concept has just yeah, well okay so hell in a cell 2019 happened and then it's just been down and then downhill from there. from there yeah it's just everything they've done since then has just actually hurt the thing more than it's helped it and yeah now he's a burnt up crispy man and thank you <laughs> and that's just that's what the gimmick is for this one is that oh he's got a slightly different outfit and... again that's the same as what the fiend is he's bray wyatt with a slightly different outfit he put a mask on that's it for some reason and this is terrible I'm imagining burning the pillsbury doughboy and that's just bray wyatt <laughs> oh yeah so i don't know how this is gonna go i mean i know prob you the thing's got to win. Yeah, he has to win. Yeah. He's like the de facto baby face that they refuse to make a baby face because even, and, and I know you guys listening that you love the heel and face turns more than anything. 
Alexa Bliss and Bray Wyatt, people have been harping on for months because they keep saying, why don't you put them down as Alexa? Stop. Oh, my God. Uh, Bliss. There you go. Let's stop that echo dot from doing that. Bliss and Wyatt. Everybody keeps saying, why don't you put them down as baby faces? And I keep going, they're not. Because everything that we've seen from them has just been against Randy Orton. They haven't done a single thing that's made them heroes in any fashion. And then people go, well, why don't you make them tweeners? And I go, well, because they keep doing shit where they, for a while, were like, hey, maybe he's turning face and maybe she's turning face. But at the same time, let's book Bliss against Cross and make it obvious that she's still a heel. So it's like, even then, they didn't even want to go into the full-blown let's go with a, a babyface fiend type of thing. They just decided, no, nah, we want to tell this story for whatever reason. I don't know if it's Bruce Pritchard really wanted to get his hands on this because it seems theory. like that's, that's one of his kind of babies, you know? I definitely think that this is a Pritchard one. I just did an article the other day about how he wishes he was around for Papa Shango because he would have had people taking bumps off of nothing because he had voodoo dolls. And I'm like, oh, this sounds like Bray Wyatt. That sounds like that's why they're doing yeah. what they're doing. I yeah. fully expect that that's the case. And Pritchard's had a lot of good ideas with some of the other things in the past, too. So it's not like me going like, oh, Pritchard's got his hand on it or whatever. No, I think that he actually can contribute really well to this. And if they condensed The Fiend and Bray Wyatt, his entire run into a two-year span, then it's great. It just happens to be that he's got a lot for every good thing that uh, they've done with Bray Wyatt over the past 10 years. They've done 50 bad things. Because for each. The Fiend pops up and he has his completely destroying Seth Rollins moment. You've got things like the whole tag team of Matt Hardy and losing to the B team. This isn't good enough. This is just not good enough. If you were going to go with Orton versus Wyatt and redo that whole feud that we've just seen a couple years ago, you needed to make it worth the while. And one instance of Orton burning Wyatt and then dragging it out for five more months doesn't do it for me. Sorry. I'm going to be honest and say, at least for me, it's still better than the proposed or the rumored fiend and bliss against Beth and, uh, yeah, yeah, that, that I did not want to see that. And I, I still think this is better. I don't think that it's better. I think it's on par. It just happens to not screw edge over. You, well, I think Randy can afford one that he gets screwed over. Edge can't afford a WrestleMania where he gets screwed over. Shit. I would have rather have had the Bray Wyatt versus Willow thing. And that's saying a lot. I'll give you that. I would rather have that too. Hello. So yeah, you're not uh, super big on this either, Callum. You think this is going to be the worst match of the night? If it stays as a straight up singles match, yeah, because these two have given me no indication in previous singles matches they've had together that they can do a good match together. And the Fiend has had, I think, two good singles matches in his entire run. I mean, if you count the Finn Balor one to start off with, then maybe that. But that was more of just like an immediate squash. But then you have the match against Daniel Bryan and the match against Kevin Owens. And, and I know what people will say about Randy Orton, like master craftsman, student of the game, whatever. He's not, he's, he can't work anywhere near the level of those two can, especially with a guy like Bray Wyatt. So I, yeah, I just think that if it stays a straight up singles match between these two, because they have to try and appease the fact that the fans are there and so they don't want to play a video recording. Of a five five fun house match instead, which would have gone way more over. Then yeah, this match is gonna suck. And so yeah, that's all I can really say. Fiend wins. Move on. Mm. You going yeah. Fiend to Rob? Or do you think that they're gonna <laughs> yeah. win the Orton? You know, I think Randy Orton. No, but Bray Wyatt has to win because eventually he still hasn't fought McIntyre, and they got to do that match. Yeah, I think he that wins. that might be the feud afterward, and that's probably why they haven't been turning him babyface. <sighs> All right, we got that out of the way. <laughs> Let's talk about a match that ultimately everybody's going to forget is even on this card: Matt Riddle against Sheamus for the United States Championship. 
this. Seamus needs to beat the fuck out of him. There's, you don't, look, I love Matt Riddle. I think he's a great wrestler. People aren't there with Riddle. They're annoyed by his allegations of sexual assault. They're, Seamus needs to beat the fuck out of him. And bro, kick him one, two, three. In fact, you should do what you did with Brian eight years ago, whatever it was. Or nine years ago, Jesus. And just have him win immediately. I wouldn't go that far. I do think that Riddle's not going to get the positive reception that maybe they were hoping. But there's also, I mean, look, I don't think that this is an excuse either. (laughs) But a portion of it is true. We always joke that WWE thinks that we're all complete idiots. And that we all forget things, and that's why we need to to be reminded constantly about this thing just happened. Here's a recap kind of thing. But a portion of the audience, they're just not the type of people who are going to remember that that happened. And some people are just going to be like, some people make excuses, some people whatever, you know. But some people don't even know, because there are casual fans that just don't follow any of this stuff too. So in their mind, Matt Riddle is just what you see on TV. And there's going to be a portion of people that are like, yeah, it was a couple months ago, who cares? There's unfortunately going to be a couple people that are like, good for him. And like, you know, some pretty terrible people that are out there. I don't think that job and riddle out solves the issue. I think that that, I don't know. It might maybe even cause more attention to it. Maybe either way. I think Seamus should genuinely win because he's had a great run this year too and deserves a prize. I think Seamus winning here is an option, but I think that it deals more with Keith Lee than it does with Riddle. Because Keith Lee's not on this card, and unfortunately, we don't know why, because nothing's coming out about why he's been gone. I have some theories, some speculation, of course. I don't know a damn thing, so don't don't even take this with a grain of salt. I am concerned that there is a concussion in the mix, and or that he had gone through a thing where he had... Uh, had to quarantine because of COVID, right? Right. I'm wondering if maybe there's some kind of a side effect from that. Like maybe he's had like a diminished lung capacity or something. And I'm really, really hoping that that's not the case because that's terrible in a thousand different ways. But if that is the case and that's what's kept him off of this card and he can come back whenever he can go back, hopefully as soon as possible. Cause I really wanted like, if I could have booked things the way that I wanted to book things, Keith Lee would have been probably fighting for the world championship. I'm a huge, huge fan of Keith Lee. And he was supposed to be fighting Riddle and Lashley at Elimination Chamber for the United States title. I think Keith Lee was supposed to win that match, not Matt Riddle. And that they probably would have gone with Keith Lee versus Sheamus at WrestleMania. Now, if they're not going to go in that direction because they can't, Maybe they go with Sheamus winning the title here, and Keith Lee is the one who beats Sheamus for the title down the line. So I can see that being the case. I'm ultimately going to go with Matt Riddle retaining, but if they go with Sheamus, you're going to hear me on the post show saying, okay, Keith Lee's beating him. I think I think that's fair. And that's exactly the way I see it going. I'm not convinced that it would have been Keith Lee Sheamus. I think that they would have maybe seen what they could do with McIntyre or Sheamus, even if it was just for Fastlane. And I think they rushed things with Miz just to get to a certain end point. But I think the way it should go is Sheamus wins here. There's some baby faces on Raw. Maybe he can get a good one out of Ricochet. Maybe he can, you know, have a another match with Riddle, maybe like a two out of three falls or something. But I think Sheamus should win here. And as I said, while I think Bell to Bell Riddle is good, and I, I like his stuff in the ring, I don't think that we should risk a live crowd, something like Matt Riddle wins. You know what I mean? Because I, I just want every reaction to be as positive as it can be. And that's not one of the endings that can facilitate a positive reaction. Matt Riddle wins. 
Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was not expecting. <laughs> Just. Yeah, I was, but I like the way he did it. I, I think I think Riddle's gonna win and retain his championship because he hasn't held the title for very long, and I think Vince is a big fan of him. Vince is a big fan of him. If you read Fightful Select, which I am pretty sure Callum does, uh, mm-hmm. there's a story that came out that was like, oh yeah, he forgot his line and Vince loved it. It's like, oh shit. So I, I think Callum is right in that regard that Vince is a big fan, but I'm still gonna hold out hopes that they go with Sheamus. And also, they never give Sheamus anything anymore. Like, you got the win over him on the Raw leading up to this, but Sheamus doesn't win, actually. He doesn't actually win big matches anymore. Uh, let's be honest. Know, the just... win on Raw was their quick and easy, lazy method of booking this match. Yeah, he's in a match. Yeah, and Sheamus does deserve a match for WrestleMania because he's had some really, really good matches this year. Yeah. I just feel like, okay, they won that match. He won that match, the singles match on Raw, so he's not going to win the second match they have as a singles match now as well. Even though they've probably, they, I think they wrestled like, five times in the build-up to Survivor Series and around about that, so this is probably it's a match we've seen plenty of times before. Yeah, I think they'll just have Riddle win and, win, and I think that they're pretty tone-deaf to what people have been saying about Matt Riddle on online and stuff like that. Or either that they're tone-deaf or they don't care because they believe what Riddle's telling them. So. I still think in, in a bit of a perfect world, Sheamus should have been the one that beat McIntyre for the title, and Drew McIntyre beats Sheamus to win it back, and then Lashley no, beats. Lashley's much better. Well, I'm saying then Lashley is the one that beats Drew McIntyre down the line with still being a part of the Hurt business, and he gets a legit title reign. Uh, I can I can understand that to a degree. Then I just but, don't think that. Good. I, yeah, I, I just don't think that there was there would have been a point of ending McIntyre's reign like that. And to be fair, maybe there wasn't any point in ending McIntyre's reign. I would have just gone with Sheamus faces Drew McIntyre and McIntyre just retains Sheamus never won the title from him. He just he just faced him at WrestleMania. For that matter, I would probably have stretched out the Orton thing a little bit. Yeah. And... Just stretch Look, it out. Four months, five months isn't enough. We need to stretch it out and out. No, and out. no, no, no. I mean the title reign. Like I think he got the belt and lost him what, two weeks later? Three weeks later? That's because they decided have... to put the belt on him right before the WrestleMania, uh, the Survivor Series type of situation where thing, yeah. they didn't plan that out ahead of time. Well, they did it because they wanted to have the Monday Night Raw thing because you wanted to bump the ratings up for Raw. Like, it's all like either they're doing something because they don't pay attention to it and they don't care, or they're doing something because they've got something else in mind that doesn't happen, or they're doing something because they think that it's a bigger priority to do it on TV or whatever. That's what they've been doing. It's, I hate in so many ways. Um, yeah, but this, hopefully it's a good match, and I guess we'll see where they go. I'm going Sheamus. I'm going Riddle. I, I'm not at all confident in that, though. There's a very, very, very good chance that Sheamus wins this match. And, at least as far as my Fantasy League team goes, I'll be upset about that, because I have Matt Riddle. (laughs) But, ultimately, you know, we don't have any money on that, so... Well, that's one mid card title. I'm surprised to a certain extent that both mid card titles are on the same night, but then again, they don't care. So uh, I shouldn't be shocked. The other one is the seventh time that Big E and Apollo Crews have fought for the Intercontinental Championship over the course of 2021. At least this one finally has a gimmick to it, despite the fact that they did absolutely nothing to build that up and make you interested in it other than the name so the intercontinental championship is on the line in a nigerian drum fight biggie is facing apollo cruz again and i maintain that this should not have been the wrestlemania match because if they wanted to go in this direction this should have just happened earlier this should have been like the second match that they had it should have happened in like january or so shouldn't have been dragged out for four months just to get to this point Cruz should not be getting another title shot because he's lost six matches that he could have won. That's friggin' overkill. And you can't tell me that it's otherwise. I am interested in the Nigerian drum fight aspect, but to be perfectly honest, I don't have a whole lot of faith in it. Because I think that what it's going to be is 
a street fight. And that's it. Yeah, I I don't really have too much to add to that aspect of it. It's just, this is a match that's happened to him often. I think the match should be good because these two are good. It should be and, fine. Yeah. And the only thing, question I have about the Nigerian drum fight from an actual match perspective is how unintentionally racist are they going to make it? <laughs> yeah, okay. So, cow moving up, uh, can of worms. Uh, realistically, people are digging this Apollo Crews thing, right? They're like, oh, it's great. He's paying homage to his heritage. There's another lens where, like, this could end up very tone deaf mm-hmm. and very bad. And now, Considering the individuals in the matchup, I do not think that they allow for a second for it to be taken in that direction. But I I don't know, man. A Nigerian drum fight? <sighs> Let's put it out this way. There's nothing inherently racist about this. But if you take it in the wrong direction, oh boy. <laughs> That's where, like... I would not feel comfortable writing this story. I would want to outsource it to somebody else who has a better input on this. That's how I would approach it. I'd be like, look, I can't pitch this. I can't book that. I would end up being the wrong person for this type of a thing because I wouldn't know which would be the insensitive direction on some ways. I would I wouldn't know some of them would get, obviously would be insensitive and everything, but you got to hope that these two are having some creative control over this. I'll put it this way. Biggie is currently working on a Kickstarter project about paying homage to black history. Apollo Crews legitimately has Nigerian royalty heritage. They ain't allowing this shit to go sideways. Hopefully. You never know if it's just going to be like, but the edict from above says, you know, Honestly, yeah. they have a potential to have a really good match here. Yeah, I'm just, I, I have no doubts about the actual quality of the in ring work and adding this aspect to it, whether it's just some sort of street fight where, which involves like drums in some fashion. I just, I always worry with a character like the Apollo Crews one is that you're just, you're one false move away from becoming Sub Simba. Yeah. Yeah, um, and well, I mean, hopefully they tread the line with that one. But I've already seen people online. Like, I think the majority of people, like you said, are behind the character. But I've seen more than a vocal minority on Twitter that are seeing the racist aspects of this character. And I feel like it will just depend on how it's portrayed in this match, and also probably a lot down to result as well because, like, you can't. Like, there's a huge part of me in my brain that's saying you can't have Apollo Crews lose another match for the Intercontinental Championship. Especially a Nigerian drum fight. Yeah. So and then I, I go, to... so then I go You can't have Big E lose. So, yeah, yeah. Well no, I think that yeah, I think that Big E wins and retains the championship here. It's a no win situation, and that's one of the reasons why this shouldn't have been the match at WrestleMania. Because they should have done this at a time frame where it would have gotten out of the way and then it would have been like Apollo loses to Big E. Apollo keeps attacking Big E, challenges him to if you want to do the Nigerian drum fight thing, you do the Nigerian drum fight. And then either Apollo wins then and Big E's doing something else at WrestleMania, or Big E retains then and Apollo is doing something else at WrestleMania. And Big E goes in as the champion or whatever. I don't think that they've set this up right. So I'm gonna say what I said at Fastlane. Big E deserves a win and is on a nice run, but Apollo can't lose. He cannot lose here. He cannot lose in a match that he has created, even if it is like a Belfast brawl in the sense that it's just a gimmick for the guy and his heritage and name only. He can't lose this and then be a serious threat. Yeah. I go I'm leaning a little bit more towards Apollo and I'm not confident in that at all. 
this one's totally a flip a coin type of thing. It all depends on where they want to go afterward. And there's part of me that thinks that they are going to put the belt on Apollo and then however long from now Cesaro is going to win the Intercontinental Championship and that's their big game plan for Cesaro. But then again, I'm not super duper confident in that. By the matter, uh, for that matter, by the way, if that happens, Big E gets a title shot eventually because I don't think that we're going to keep a, a babyface champion for super long. I'll spoil that. <laughs> so, yeah, gun to my head, I'm going Apollo Crews winning this if I have to make a decision right now. I'll see what happens on SmackDown. It might change. You know, we might, when we're doing our predictions, it might be like, oh, okay, they set up Big E to win this one, you know? Um, my inclination is to go with Big E right now for Tony. What do you think is going to be a better match? The drum fight or Riddle and Sheamus? The drum fight. Yeah, I'd say the drum fight as well. Then we have the main... Oh, wait, no, we don't have the main event. We still have one more. Uh, Bad Bunny is going to be on night one, so let's get a celebrity on night two because Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn are fighting for the millionth time, but at least it's been a little while. And the hook of this, and basically the reason why it's happening, let's be honest, is that they got Logan Paul, who I couldn't care less about because I remember <laughs> I said I don't care about celebrities. And when you bring a celebrity in, it doesn't matter if it's somebody I'm not a fan of or somebody that I'm not aware of or if it's somebody that I'm a huge fan of. I'm still just going to be like, eh, I don't really care. You know, <laughs> I, I think that this is Logan Paul is the bonus. I think they were going with these two either way. I don't think that they would have been in a match. I think that they would have been in the Battle Royal if it wasn't for Logan Paul. Well, I had said this on yesterday's podcast about uh, NXT, and I'll say it here. Um, listen, Sami Zayn should have nerve and heel. And unfortunately, he's done too good with it now. And he's always going to be the snarky, obnoxious heel because he's played the role too well. I think in any case, when you have Sami and Kevin, it needs to be Kevin's a monster heel. Sami's a baby face. They're flipping the roles here. I'm just glad they got on Mania because they deserve it. And yeah. I mean, this match is just... I mean, it's partly happening because of Logan Paul's involvement. It's also just happening because it's Kevin Owens versus Sami Zayn. Isn't that cool? But a match that was never, ever supposed to happen again. Yeah, and happened back. 15 more <laughs> times. After I that. mean, to be fair, at least it's at least it's been a while since their last it's match. It's been like five years at this point, hasn't it? No, not that long. I'd probably, yeah, I'd probably say about two, three years because they had the match after WrestleMania 34 against each other. Gonna, I think that was the last time they had a singles match. I'm gonna look this up on cage match in the meantime. Yeah. So if you uh, hear that, it's me typing that. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think that this um it should be good because it is these two involved, and I think they're basically they're biologically dr driven not to have bad matches against each other. So I'm sure this match will be a lot of fun, regardless of the fact the alignment is different than what it usually is. And. Yeah, I, I don't really know what Logan Paul's involvement is. I'm pretty sure that his favorite wrestling moment of all time is when Undertaker hanged Big Boss Man. Oh my experiences. god. <laughs> oh my. Ca uh. All right, Callum wins co host of the year, and I refuse to even be nominated. Jesus. He's great. <laughs> <laughs> uh. I just saw that and thought, like, yeah, but you guys did that too for a few. Um, you know what's but, funny um, is for a split second you got me where I was like did he really say that that's terrible to hear. and then I was like oh god <laughs> he didn't just no he didn't just say it he showed you it. But, um, he showed it uh. yeah but uh, maybe that'll get over more in the Tokyo Dome but uh, anyway we'll have um, I, I'm sure this match will be yeah like I said I'm sure this match will be great I don't know what Logan Paul's involvement will be in terms of just actually involvement in the match like you said, I think there might be something to do with the R Truth twenty four seven title, which will be more of his actual involvement in this entire show. But does he screw Sami Zayn out of the match? Does he like they want Logan Paul to be babyface? They want him to be heel. I think they'll want him to be babyface because anybody from the outside world 
is better than us, so they have to be the good guys. Yeah. It's Maybe very rare that there's a, a heel in the mix, and usually when there is like a heel celebrity, it ends up being much cooler. <laughs> so I don't know why well, they don't he'll... bother to do that more often, you know? Well, I think he'll be booed. Yeah, oh, he will be. Because, because he's a pool brother. Yeah. <laughs> and everyone hates the pools, really. <laughs> no, not really. They have a huge legion of fans. People yeah, like Triple but... H. Yeah. But, I, but I don't know how much crossover there is between those fans and fans of WWE. I'm sure there's a portion of the WWE crowd that likes the fact that I look at Paul the way that he is. You yeah. Know. But I, I'm going to go with Kevin Owens winning this match. I could see a scenario where Logan Paul screws over Kevin Owens oh, yeah. and Sami Zayn wins. And it's like, oh, look at that. Like, we, there's no conspiracy. I actually won this because I'm the one who created a conspiracy. And I set up this whole thing with Logan Paul to get you, Kevin. To Now, now in know. fairness, if the pop there is Kevin Owens stuns Logan, Logan Paul, Paul, I get behind that. It might not be a bad scenario. For uh, anybody who's wondering about the Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn matches, by the way, if you ignore that they were both in the Elimination Chamber match earlier this year, which really doesn't count too much, there was a six-man tag in February setting up that that they were on opposite sides for. doesn't really count, of course. There was a live house show in 2019, in uh, August of 2019, where they fought. But the last TV match that they had... Seems like it was at least 2019 because I'm I'm going back here and there. Uh, the night after WrestleMania 34. No, so they got because they were teaming for a little oh, right. while. Uh, funny enough, he beat uh Kevin Owens beat Sami Zayn in a dark match on 205 Live. <laughs> I don't know how that's the case. In April of 2019. So it's been a couple of years. I'm, I still haven't even found it because most of the time they've been teaming with each other for a while. And the last idea of them being like, you know, OK, these two are just fighting against each other. It seems like it might be this one that I just came across of April 2018. I'm willing to ignore that. I'm not the type. I am the type of person who says this is a rematch and it shouldn't have been done, but I'm reasonable. <laughs> I'm not going to say that something that happened four years ago or five years ago or whatever is like, okay, well you can't ever do that match again. It does get to me when it ends up being like, Hey, Apollo and Biggie have fought for the seventh time in three months. Um, What's the over under on Logan Paul winning the 24 seven championship? How likely do you think it is? It's almost a guarantee. I think it's like 95%. Yeah, I'd say there's a high possibility. I don't think I'd go that far. I think I'd probably go like 75%. Yeah, so if you're wondering where our truth is going to be on this card, that's probably where he will pop up. You know what else would be kind of fun, though? Maybe they are able to do this. Maybe they're not. I don't think that this is happening, but it's a possibility. Maybe they do tie back into Gronkowski, and they can get him to pop up. And that could be just... Because, I mean, it's the same stadium. And maybe they do something where... I don't know, R-Truth does something with Logan Paul or whatever, and then, like, wins the title back, and then Gronk pops up out of nowhere and wins the title, and then later on, R-Truth wins it back or something. That'd be kind of fun, to a certain extent. Either way, I fully see uh, R-Truth doing a bit where he's like, oh, Jake Paul, you're my favorite. And and it'll be a pop because he's Logan. And it's not as funny as the calling Gronkowski Tom Brady and saying, I'm coming for you, Tom Brady. but It'll do the job. You know what would really make me laugh? If he calls him Paul White. <laughs> Just like... It would make me laugh even more if he calls him KSI. <laughs> uh, that'd be good. <laughs> so then we have one more match to talk about here. This is the main event, most likely, of course. On night two, it is the Universal Championship triple threat match between Roman Reigns, Tribal Chief, and the Universal Champion. Against the Royal Rumble winner, Edge. And also Daniel Bryan's there. Because, you know, why not, I guess? <laughs> he They did a whole thing, a roundabout way of setting up for him to be in this match. And that's going to be a positive in some ways. A negative in some ways, too, I'd argue. 
Brian being added to a match is always going to help out on the in-ring side of things, I think. And he does provide a definitive babyface type of role here, where Edge is more of a tweener and Roman Reigns is definitely the heel. Maybe he also provides the person who loses. Because I can see a scenario where Reigns wins by pinning Brian instead of Edge. I can see a scenario where Edge wins by pinning Brian instead of Reigns. I can't see a scenario where Brian wins. Period. Really? Because I see a scenario where Brian wins. Again, if you want to pop the crowd, that's an easy way. I think you pop the crowd with Edge, though. I also think you pop the crowd with Roman, for that matter, because the, yeah. the audience hasn't seen this Roman. This might be one of those weird, weird matches where you would think that there would be, like, cheers in one direction or whatever. It might just be, like, a series of just... Because nobody knows what to really do. I mean, personally, when Tony says, like, I don't see a scenario of Daniel Bryan win, I only see a scenario of Daniel Bryan win. Really? Yep, I'm 100% confident Daniel Bryan's winning this. It's just, it's WrestleMania 30 all over again, baby. You have, it's essentially, it's been built the exact same way, is that Daniel Bryan, well, Daniel, the only difference is Daniel Bryan was in the Royal Rumble, and he could have won it that way if they wanted to go with that approach. But they have Edge win it, Edge isn't as over as everyone expected him to be. Uh, the ratings plummet with Edge on TV. Uh, they decided that, oh, okay, maybe part of the reason is that is because Edge is just doing the babyface thing, and nobody really likes the babyface. They want the radar superstar, more visceral edge. And to do that, you put Daniel Ryan into the mix, and he's like, like you say, the de facto babyface of this entire three-way feud. You've got Roman, who's finally going to be pretty, we all assume to be pretty over for the first time at WrestleMania, and probably his entire, ever, or ever since the Shield broke up the first time. And... I think that they're it's basically running the same way. Edge is Batista in this environment, and Roman is Randy Orton, except that he's slightly more, he's a lot more over than Randy Orton was. But I think that you just go, you go with the scenario of Brian forces Edge to tap it out. That sends Edge over, it sends it sends Edge over the edge, and basically makes him full blown heel for the rest of his run with the company. And you continue with Roman chasing Brian and eventually winning the belt back from him, and then you move on from there. But I think this is just, it's almost like a gold watch type thing for Daniel Bryan, almost. I know he's already had a WWE title reign in the last couple of years, but I feel like he gets to win it on the big stage in front of the crowd and the first WrestleMania back in front of fans, the first show back in front of fans in over a year. And there will be, yeah, I think that's that's what they see as being the big happy go home moment of the entire thing. And the only way that that doesn't go down is if they actually end up booing Brian because everybody's so into Tribal Chief Roman. Now, fortunately, I think enough time has passed that maybe people have not like fully soured on it, but are starting to go, okay, it's, he's almost being booked like a Brock Lesnar who's on TV every week. And maybe that gets people to cheer Daniel Bryan. I fully expect this to end with Daniel Bryan versus Edge for the championship. And I'm of the belief that Roman Reigns, especially if they're doing a shakeup, just goes to Raw. Because I think at the end of the day, they like their big characters and their most popular stories on the Monday Night brand. And Raw just pulled in a 1.7 rating or so like i think they just moved to the uh raw brand and they just do roman reigns paul Heyman on raw and keep edge and daniel bryan on smackdown where they'd probably rather be anyway but they won't do that if they have both bobby lashley and drew mcintyre over on the raw side oh i think one of them will move i don't know which one probably not uh, mcintyre probably Lashley. I think that there is a solid chance that Roman Reigns is the one that beats Drew McIntyre. And I don't know where they're going to go with this Bobby Lashley thing, because I don't think that they've thought it through. I mean, if they would have thought it through, I think that they would have realized they probably would get cheered anyway. But 
I could see a scenario where we get like a, sh- a superstar shakeup after Mania, and maybe they do that the week after the Raw after WrestleMania kind of a thing, and maybe they like here's. I'm not saying I think that this is going to happen necessarily, but here's something I could see happening. And if it is, then I'll go back and be like, see, I brought it up, but uh, I'm going to pull a a Meltzer here. This, this direction or that direction or that direction. And if any of them happened, then I told you that kind of thing. Um, I could see edge. Brian going forward, reigns being shifted over to raw through a shakeup and potentially even Bobby Lashley being, moved over to SmackDown and feuding with like Daniel Bryan, maybe even beating him and winning that championship and doing a whole big thing or something. I don't know if they want to go like, now we'll give you a championship run because of whatever. I don't know. But I do think Edge and Bryan is something that's going forward. I think that there's also just a chance that they just keep the belt on Roman Reigns and it ends up just being, he pins Daniel Bryan and Bryan had his opportunity to get his win by making Roman Reigns tap out. And that's good enough. And Edge doesn't lose, but he got his title match and he can take some time off and do that kind of a thing. I can see that being the case, too. This is going to be those one of those types of situations where they either have no idea what they're doing going forward and they're just going to start throwing out random stuff. Or they've got a plan for at least one of these guys that's going to dictate everything. And a well, they've got couple a plan for one of them. It's Roman, and it's The Rock next year. Well, I mean, like, a plan that we'll know more about in, like, three weeks kind of a thing. Where we're going to look back on media and go, oh, okay. So that's why they did this, 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 and this. All because of this one person kind of a thing. You know what I mean? Because we've gotten that in the past where it's been like, you know, why did they book... Goldberg and Brock the way that they were leading heading up into Wrestlemania and then it was like okay you did all this stuff because in your mind you wanted to do Brock and Goldberg at Mania for the title and then lead for a whole year into the Roman Reigns thing and then you know like that that kind of thing is like all right I get it you had this priority in mind and that took 15 things in that direction and long-term storytelling is something that Triple H keeps harping on even if they keep not following through with it, which defeats the purpose. So in their mind, they probably have some specific thing that they really want to do here. And it's not going to make any sense until it happens. That could be just keep the belt on Roman for another year. Or it could be Edge wanted to have a title reign. Or it could be Daniel Bryan's the baby face. I, I don't know. I don't feel comfortable in my prediction for this, no matter what of the three that I go with. And but that I am... is why it's my favorite match on the card, because it's the one match where you just don't know, and all the scenarios are actually pretty damn good. Because Edge, 10 years to the day since he had to retire, I think he should win it based on that alone. Brian, you can never really count out, because he's a great baby face. Roman Reigns is as hot as he's ever been. He really shouldn't lose. It's it's a good match. It's kind of like a no-lose situation in my mind, because I like all three. It'll just be a matter of where do they go after this, and do I think that that's the right way to do it? And I might be like, oh, wow, okay, that's even better than I thought or something. I don't know. I'm feeling more confident about that I'm going to be happy about this end result that I am for a lot of the other ones just because it's like, all right, well, if any of the three win, there's going to be something that's positive for that I can take out of it. Yeah, I, I kind of went a similar boat. I think you can do something interesting with all three of these guys, depending on who you want to have win, as long as they have something interesting planned for one of whoever it is afterwards. And yeah, I mean, the feud itself has been fairly... I mean, I've enjoyed it, but I also like um, uh, your co-worker, Rob, uh, Jeremy Lambert's take on the whole thing of just the, the Edge and Daniel Bryan are just little bitches. 
that have just been complaining this entire time that oh I want a shot at the title. Well, I want a shot at the title. <laughs> it's just like, well, I don't like you being involved in this. Well, I want still want to have a shot at Roman cheated in that last match and that sort of thing. And um, so it has had that aspect, but considering the fact of how badly all the other matches have been booked, it's probably still one of the best book matches going into this show. And yeah, I think that if you are going to close it off properly, I think realistically your your best options are either Edge or Daniel Bryan, and I'm still leaning towards Daniel Bryan as my final pick. Gun to my head, I'm going with Edge. Yeah, I'm going more so Edge. Which isn't going to be good for my fantasy league team, <laughs> but um, if Roman Reigns wins, I'll be happy about that too. You know, like then that'll be like, okay, you're you're cementing him as being he's not just going to lose all of his matches now that he's a heel, kind of a thing. Well, but in fairness, I really do think that this should end with a baby face going over. It didn't happen with like The Rock or anybody. Of like a really high caliber, but that's the way the cookie crumbles, you know. Like, I think Edge is of that caliber. I just don't think Edge versus Roman was the match that this mania needed. I still think Edge maybe should have had a match with Christian or something. <laughs> you know, well, I wouldn't really have let Christian go. Christian. Yeah. Things would be so different if I, yeah, that's a different story for another day. But that for, you know, as long as we talked about it, two and a half hours at this point or whatever, probably that has been the full card for WrestleMania that we're aware of, at least as far as around like a quarter after four on April 6th, there are still a few days left that they can change some things around or unfortunately, and this is just the fact of the matter, somebody could test positive for COVID and change everything. That's scary. We are not out of the woods for that. It could be the day of the show and it could be like six matches are different. You know, I'm banking on the idea that that's probably not going to happen. We'll probably be fine. I'm hoping that they're smart enough that they're not going to do any stupid parties or just you know, well, I don't need to wear a mask for this, whatever. You can't risk it for WrestleMania, not for the, the company's sake. The company's depending on it way too much. And if we find out that something like that happens, it wouldn't be shocked for me to find out somebody gets fired because it's like, you can't do that. Not, not now. Um, but if anything does change, we will address that on the hot tags or whenever we are aware of it, because once we get through, Smackdown and 205 Live and whatever. We'll do those hot tags. We'll be able to talk about who won the Smackdown tag team title match, who won the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal, and if they decided to add Billy Kay and Carmella or Bailey and Carmella or Bailey and Charlotte or God knows what else they might do because they more than likely will change at least something on that card. And then we'll roll on into the post shows because I'll do the live coverage on smartgunmoment.com. We'll have a live chat on the Mega Maniacs group the way that we normally do for the pay-per-views. So you can chime in and tell us your thoughts on that kind of stuff. You can subscribe to this channel and ring that little notification bell to be aware of when we go live for those post show chats and join us for that. And then uh, kind of just keep things going the whole rest of WrestleMania week. Tonight is the Hall of Fame. We're not doing anything based off of the Hall of Fame about that. But we might factor that into at least the hot tags and talk about like, you know, one of your favorite moments. Wasn't it weird that Ozzy Osbourne got barely mentioned and he was inducted, that kind of a thing. And uh, whatever big stuff like that will happen. We're not going to address stuff like that on the TakeOver post shows that'll be tomorrow night because we're going to keep that to TakeOver. But stay tuned. Follow all the stuff we've got going on. and We've got plenty coming your way. Also, if you want to help us out, you want to make sure that we do even more, not necessarily this week because we can't, but if you want to make sure that we do more of anything in particular, hit up the Patreon, hit the like button on YouTube here, follow us all over the place, leave us a star rating on the Apple podcast feed or you know Spotify or whatever it might be that you're listening to us if you're listening to us there. Check out the merchandise shops on TeePublic and Redbubble. There are uh, two different contests that are going on right now on smartcatmoma.com. 
There's also one on fanboysanonymous.com. If you want to be a part of those, they are very easy to join and get lots of entries. So you can win an NWO t-shirt, or you can win an Edge Funko Pop, or on the Fanboys Anonymous side of things, you can win a Baron Zemo Funko Pop. So take advantage of those while you can. Those giveaways are sponsored by TV Store Online and Fun.com. There's also the Smart Madness Tournament. I'm wrapping that up tomorrow night to get into the finals. So vote on the big four while you can. All that stuff is on the sidebar. If you go to smartcatmoment.com, then you will see that whole sidebar is packed under current events. And you you click on those things and you'll be following along with that as well as all the other kind of stuff that we normally have throughout the week. So TV shows are still happening. We still got the weeklies. We still got all the other kind of content that we're bringing you. And if you want more Fanboys Anonymous stuff, go to fanboysanonymous.com. Check out that stuff that's going on here. I've got other articles I'm going to be writing up and I've already written up like the history and the uh, whole rundown of the WrestleMania logo. I've got Bleacher Report stuff, any wrestling news stuff. Check that out. Follow me at Tony Mango and follow what these guys have going on on their social medias and their other projects. Rob, I'll here's the baton. First, uh, yeah, I got a bunch of shit. Follow Fightful.com. Follow WrestleZone.com. I'll be doing the Fightful Post shows for Saturday and Sunday. So while I do encourage you to check these guys out first, because obviously they're the dudes, and I just spent nearly three hours with them, so clearly I like them. (laughs) And you could also check out my opinion by checking out the Fightful Post shows with myself, Alex Kalowski, Sean Ross Sapp, and I'm pretty sure whoever else wants to show up. it's Sting! <laughs> Maybe. Outside of that, you got WrestleZone.com. Follow me on Twitter at Dude Felice, and just enjoy the week, everybody. Callum, so, catch the baton. Yeah, okay, I'll cut it. Just literally fumbled it for a second there, but I've got it now. So, <laughs> unlike these guys, I'm not stupid enough to actually write about pro wrestling, so, my, <laughs> so I'm just going to be soaking in the week as a fan for the most part. Uh, obviously, looking forward to being involved in the the take both takeover post shows and both WrestleMania post shows here on the Smart Cat Moment side of things. Unless I get a call up to fight for, but I think that's very unlikely at this point. But we'll see. <laughs> Doesn't want any of my uh, my hot takes getting involved with that stuff. But I'm just me just sitting there on the fight with podcast. Says, hey, what do you think about that? It's shit. <laughs> Move on. <laughs> oh, they'd give you they you'd probably get some uh, super chats that way. I hope so. Hope that you guys are uh, listening will be uh, be generous enough to hand out a few of those during the uh, r- the uh, takeover or WrestleMania post shows. That's obviously obviously greatly appreciated. Two thumbs up. Other than that, on my you want to go? Ahead? No, I'm just saying two thumbs up for that. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. Um, add on to that, if you're if you don't get your feel enough of the wrestling that's going on in this place, and you just want to feel some some of that free time in between the WrestleMania shows and takeover shows with more wrestling content, then go back and listen to 2001 wrestling odyssey and the Paul Heyman's Matt down podcast, which will give you plenty of stuff to mull over from the Rufus Gresham era and the latter days of the attitude era. Uh, check out the power rankings as well as every other thing that's going on in the smart cam moment, uh, com website, uh, power rankings. It's the final week of the 2020 to 2021 year because I always reset it after WrestleMania. So you get to find out who finished as the most, I guess, the, the top person for the end of the year for the power rankings, uh, who was on the the like the like top 10 the most, who was the, the most highest ranked person, all that, all the great stuff. Uh, and follow me on Twitter, with my support team. And that's, yeah, that's it for me. Yeehaw. Okay, mm. everyone, that's it for WrestleMania 37 predictions. Hopefully you uh, are having a great day. Hopefully you're having a great week. We will see you with the TakeOver post-show. TakeOver Night 1 is the next time you're going to be hearing from us. So stay tuned for that. Join us for the live chat if you can, and we will see you then. But for now, this has been another Smart Out moment, and we're being counted out. 